welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. It's a great day outside. It's a great day for New York, but I still think it's a great day for theater. Uh, all of us coming together live, even so we are all by used to it now, but still these are the events we thought about, we dreamed about in this mm -hmm. terrible time of COVID. And we are here to celebrate life, the arts, New York City, but also the theater. And we do, of course, do think what makes a city a city is the arts that's inside. Um, as we all know, we don't need carpets in our homes. Uh, we don't need uh, paintings. We don't need wall colors. We don't need beautiful things. We could all live without it, but it would be horrible. The same is that we're in a city. We need the arts. We need music. We need the sculptures and especially live performances to be in the moment and experience and seeing something different, something thinking, something we haven't thought before. And this is what theater does. And uh, they are the great artists who do this, artists who live in the moment, often even anticipate the future. And this is what great artists do. They onto something, not even just in the moment, they anticipate it and they do it. But where do they do it? And where do they do it in the city where real estate uh, has been taken over like the French aristocratic, aristocratic system that ruled uh, Paris, you know, these are the landlords here. And, but they have always been spaces. Artists have found spaces, but also great producers of theaters. And there's a great history in America of independent producers, of creating space, uh, giving space to artists, which in my view is also an artistic endeavor. It's an artistic expression, it's an artistic work. And I think one of the great ones in New York City is uh, Robert Lyons. So a big round of applause. That, that was a long walk. But I and what uh, Robert uh, did uh, really is an extraordinary. There is the Dakota building that once was called the Dakota because it was so far outside and he is the Ohio that seems even further, but actually it was in the center in the heart of downtown theater, like many others, like La Mama, like the Foundry Theater, Melanie is here uh, with us, and, um, and so many other great institutions, Richard Foreman's work. But the Ohio was a place that had open doors and open door policies. So many artists came through, and Robert was um, not the gatekeeper. He was the gate opener. And this is so very, very rare. And he's a model for all of us, I think also a model for uh, lots of producers out there who are, will be taking over one day in their spaces and uh, they will look up to him. So uh, Robert, thank you so much for being here, helping us to prepare. It's a big honor. We have done many things together. We also held an event of the closing of the Ohio. And, um, but I think it's important to celebrate achievements. We all get very upset, things go wrong, close down, but I think we have to put the same energy into celebrating. Um, and this is an incredible achievement. And I'm so proud uh, to know Robert and to have worked with him and his work is truly um, extraordinary. We at the Siegel Bridge Academia, international and American theater, but also New York uh, theater. And uh, so this is uh, something where also Robert uh, helped us uh, to connect. He actually once hosted Coltes. We had a big evening here about the French writer. We produced a book. He's an icon in Europe. And uh, actually they were hanging out. He was hanging out at Robert's and Lenora's apartment. And um, so um, it's an extraordinary work. I would like to welcome also our viewers on HowlRound. Um, so I would like to thank you, VJ and Emily for hosting us. They've been a great partner for over 10 years. Our audience online is much larger than this. So this is perhaps why it's also a little bit less next to the fact it's sunny and an afternoon. Um, now um, we uh, think an online presence is significant and we have changed our ideas and we feel this is something um, of importance and it will also serve as an archive. And maybe Robert, you can also tell us what you have in mind to do it. But now without any further ado, it's last thing, take out your cell phones and I'll do the same and check. Here it's off. It should say silent mode or something. It, it never rings in our events, it's really true. And um, it would be the very first ever, so we can't have that happen. So um, Robert, before we come to the first panel, tell us a little bit. Uh, well, of course, uh, thank you all for coming and thank you to the artists uh, ahead of time who are gonna talk with us today. Um, it, it is a great honor to be asked to do this. Um, it's funny to go back and look at the old websites and look at the old things and actually realize how long <laughs> we were doing this. 
we go back to 1987 is when it started. Uh, and I've been talking to some of the artists and, and of course to me it's just one big long blur and how who's overlapped with who. There were so many different sections. There was a whole section between 87 and 92. It was Project 3, uh, Soho Think Tank, you know, Ohio. Uh, so anyway, what you're going to see tonight is just uh, a small sampling of some great artists who participated uh, in the space and, and built a space and built a reputation of the space. And um, we're also just great people to make theater with and hang out with. So that's who you're some of the, that's who you're going to meet today as a representative of a greater body of artists. So with that, I think we should bring up the first first folks. So we're going to bring up uh, three. Come on up. This is Lenore Champagne, playwright, performance artist. Nella Wagman, Watermark Theater. Jeremy Dobrish. Adobe Theater. So this is the beginning of, of the day uh, at the Siegel of the Ohio. Also, hi to Chuck Me, who is here with us, next to many, many other great artists here in the room. So um, I think I should start at the beginning. You start. First of all, maybe a very few sentences down the line, who you are and what you do, like three, four sentences, and then we start with you. Uh, I'm Lenora Champagne, and uh, as Robert said, I'm a performance artist, a playwright, um, a director, an educator. And a personal connection to Robert, too, well, right, as I Well, yes, heard. but I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Uh-oh. I'm Nella Wagman. I... Um, founded Watermark Theater, which was a resident company at the Ohio for a bunch of years, long time. Um, and there we produced and I directed uh, new works and a, a festival called the Word Fire Festival of Solo Performance, where we premiered people like Dale Orlando Smith and John O'Keefe and Fred Kerchak and all kinds of really amazing solo performers. Owen oh, Susan Miller in a play called My Left Breast, which I directed, which ended up okay. mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, uh, hi, I'm Jeremy Dobrish. Uh, I was artistic director and founder of Adobe Theater Company for about 13 years. I'm a playwright, director, and creative director. Fantastic. So, Lenora, floor is yours. Okay, so in 1988, um, I was working um, with the Worcester Group on St. Anthony, and uh, Robert Lyons, I didn't know he existed. Uh, he was uh, working at the Ohio Theater. And we both went to the uh, Rye, New York, the train station, uh, to see the dress rehearsal of Peter Sellers' Marriage of Figaro. And Robert, who I didn't know, said, um, are you going to purchase summer fare? And I said, yes. And he said, would you like to share a cab? And that was the beginning. So um, after that, he gave me his. It was very smooth. <laughs> As usual. Anyway, he gave he gave me his um, card, and it said Ohio Theater, and I realized that was literally the next block from the Wooster Group where I was working. So um, we had lunch at one point, and. Um, at that particular lunch, at the end, he realized he didn't have his wallet. But what had happened smooth. is that, no, that wasn't a smooth, but what had just happened is that um, he had been attacked outside the Ohio Theater. He, was, he had gone out to get coffee for people working on a, on a show, one of his shows, I'm sure, and then, uh, these guys came toward him and he instinctively shut the door so that they couldn't get into the theater. And they had these wooden boards and hit him under the chin and he still has a scar there. Anyway, so his chin was bandaged at that lunch and he had a good reason for why he'd been preoccupied and had forgotten his wallet. So anyway, that was the beginning and then in 1989, 
I was at the time teaching at Trinity College and we did Dr. Charcot's hysteria shows and needed a space. And we talked to Robert, who was running the Ohio Theater, and set up, and, and Jerry Rojo did the set. First thing they did was have a professional cleaners come in and clean the entire space, because the women were performing barefoot. And so that was a really critical component of it. And it was, it was a fantastic experience to perform in that space. And in 1990, I did Isabella Dreams, The New World, which is a large scale piece that um, was about Isabella, a, a woman who wishes for change and dreams of Isabella. And uh, Columbus is in it and the Cajun girl. It's, it's a very um, complicated piece with music by Zena Parkins. Um, and then other shows happened. Um, Nella, I was in your World, World, World Fire Festival, and community got built because uh, Susan Burnfield, along with um, the new uh, with Project Three, helped uh, one of my shows happen in the summer. Melanie produced me at at uh, Alice's Fourth Floor. Um, and I just want to, uh, one person who can't be here is, um, I want to read what she had to say, because I, and then that'll sum up what I'm going to say. Uh, this is from Karen Coonrod of Arden Party. Oh, and another person who can't be here um, also uh, presented me through Tweed, Kevin Maloney. So, it became a real community where we all got to know one another and, and um, helped one another develop, I'd say. This is from Karen Coonrod of Arden Party. I'll never forget our first meeting about Arden Party running the space for two weeks in 1988. And you said, well, great. When shall we seal the deal in your inimitable, cool, relaxed style? With our first huge production, The Giants of the Mountain by Pirandello, we didn't have a final dress because of the fire in the basement. Yet it was okay, even more than okay. I remember right from my dream, the first moment of the play was James Urbaniak emerging on my childhood pogo stick, heading straight for the audience. I remember my professors from Columbia and my mentor, Li Vu Chulia, coming to this first production, my debut in New York City. And we continued with so many projects, Waiting for Godot, Love's Labor's Lost, Antigone, The Emperor of the Moon, Victor, or Children Take Over, King Lear, which I remember they all had clown noses, The Beggar's Opera, and more. I remember the owner coming around all the time. I remember three of us, Mary, James, and me, collapsed dead tired from scenic work inside the long blacks on the floor and slept through the quiet night. I remember the second day of Amelie's life. Amelie is our daughter. When you brought her down to show us and we all gathered round, riveted. I forgot to say we got married. And we had a party. We had a party at the Ohio Theater. It was really great. Um, okay. Um, I remember our only primal marketing strategy was making huge black and white posters and plastering them all over downtown to attract a crowd to the Ohio. I remember our Romeo and Juliet all in red costumes in the gray space. I remember Quentin Crisp coming to our production of the importance of being earnest. I remember Jim Nicola saying it was fun to come to one of our productions at the Ohio because we always configured it in a new way. I remember my mother coming to the performances and discovering things in the space missing at home. I remember... <laughs> I remember the beautiful actors who made up Arden Party and all the people who worked on the projects, inhabiting them and fighting for them. 
So we sealed the deal with you, Robert Lyons, and nearly did 10 years of work together at the Ohio Theater. At every turn and twist of the whirlwind, it was a joy to work together. Together we were a provocative part of the downtown theater scene in Manahata. Amazing. Nila, uh, what did the Ohio mean to you? Oh my goodness. Um, a, a lot of things. I mean, it was it was an amazing space. It was very inspiring just as a space. And it had a lot of history in it. It had been a, a sweatshop and it had that architecture. And I remember the rehearsal spaces that we sometimes were able to use on the fifth floor. You look out the window and there were still sweatshops when we first came. Yeah, and, you, and you'd see groups of, of women workers um, you know, greeting each other in the morning and leaving at night. And I think by the time we left the Ohio, um, I think Madonna and the famous photographer who did her book. Stephen Michael. Yes, had his studio instead. <laughs> in the, so that was like the, you know, the lifespan of, of that space that sort of saw it all, microcosm of what became of Soho. Um, there were these wonderful pillars and everybody who worked there had to make them work in a space and so they became some I, I have to say I miss them all the time you know they they were just so um they made you really think about the space in a different way and also about design in a different way I learned a lot about design because of those pillars um I worked with amazing artists who taught me so much so I think I guess to sum it all up I would have to say that I just you know I learned about generosity in terms of art artistry by working with Robert, because he really let everyone in, and he really encouraged every kind of art and work. And I learned a lot about making art from that space. Jeremy, same question. Well, you're probably going to hear a lot of similar stories uh, over the course of this, but I would say a few things. Uh, the first has to be the space. The, the space was a character in every production that you saw there. And as a creative team, you had to figure out what do we want to do with this incredible character? And anytime anybody ever said, you know, oh, it won't work because of the columns or something like that, the columns always ended up being like, mm -hmm. I don't want to say the best part, but you figured it out, you know? And it, it, and you were talking about, you know, what it taught you. For me, it taught you that, you know, the, the challenges are the opportunities that's looking at those columns and figuring out what you want to do with them. That's the fun of it. That's not the problem. Uh, the second part has to be Robert himself. And I loved what you said about being a, a gate opener instead of a gatekeeper. I mean, we're the trees and he's the forest. You know, it's like he just saw the whole thing and made it happen year after year after year. And it's, I mean, it's just incredible. There's nothing else like it in the history of theater, what, what Robert did. I want to um, just mention uh, following that, what you two said um, about Robert, the barn doors, because no one has mentioned the barn doors yet, although they may get mentioned. And for his final production in that, in that old Ohio space, Nostradamus predicts the death of Soho, um, the barn doors were opened and he got permission from Morgan Le Fay to have the actress in the Morgan Le Fay window, which was opposite the street. So both the change in the neighborhood from sweatshop to designer boutiques and this sense of the space as always providing um, possibilities was made manifest, I think, in that production. Yeah, we, we did a show where we you know opened up the barn door and the actor jumped out the, you know, onto the street. And it was so much fun because every time you opened that door, you didn't know what you were going to find, you know, then you'd scare the crap out of people walking down the street or people would wave to the audience. And it was, it was a joy. Um, I could keep going or I don't know if you want to. So just two more things I would add um, about the Ohio. One was the artists. I mean, just all of the incredible people, some of whom are here, but I mean, there's just hundreds, thousands of them that, that came through that space and learned their craft and um, became so much better uh, by having that experience. And then the last thing I would say is the community of audience. Um, the people who came down and supported that work 
and who found value in the kind of work that we were doing. Um, and and that, I mean, I know some of it is archived, but a lot of it isn't. You know, you were either there or you weren't there. And people got that, that this was an event to be a part of and a, a community be, to be a part of. And, um, and Robert built that uh, and, and we all benefited from it. Robert, what are your memories from that time? Well, I, I'm thinking of a lot of different things, but uh, <laughs> the w one thing that strikes me here and with the people we're going to talk to is how long these relationships went on. Um, you mentioned 13 years of Adobe. That wasn't all with us, but at least 10, 11. Now, uh, you, you know, Lenora, your time spans, same with these people. Um, and it's kind of crazy that um, that kind of time allowed real deep relationships to to form and not just with me, but with each other and the way we we're trying to piece together who was there when. It's such a long span of time. Some people uh, caught the end of one group and it was there for eight years, but they got they were there for two years. But then that group was there for seven years and then somebody came in for five years and then somebody else was there for 10 years. So there was really a sense of uh, people. Once people came, they wanted to come back, and they came back, and they came back, and they came back. And um, I think that's partly why it had uh, the feeling that it did, because everybody knew each other, everybody was looking at watching each other's shows, everybody was using each other's artists, actors, designers. So it, it was very special. When did you have the idea to say, I'm going to run a theater and invite artists to come? And how did you find the Ohio? Uh, I, I I never had that moment, uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, it was, it, it's a much longer story. And I maybe I should tell it later because yeah. uh, we're, we're, I want to use the valuable time with these folks here. But uh, I kind of stumbled across the space when I first arrived in New York. And it wasn't, it was uh, it had been closed by the fire department and it had just been reopened. And this is the short version. And um, there's a company called Project Three, and there's members of Project Three here. And uh, and they were doing a show, and I was sleeping on uh, Jim Ingle's couch, and they were looking for a production manager, and um, that's how I met them, and that's how I met the space, and that's how I met the landlord. And he helped run, you know, manage the building in a way. Um, so that every night when the show started, he could turn the heat down so the um, radiators wouldn't go off during the show. And he would get calls from people in the building <laughs> complaining about how cold it was. But, you know, this was theater was that was we all had to make sacrifices for the theater. I, I didn't turn it down. I turned it off. <laughs> And uh, it was an eighth floor building and, and uh, in the winter it got quite cold. So I did try to book short shows uh, in the winter, but I was not always successful. Um, Neil and Jeremy, tell us a little bit about the atmosphere of that time in New York City. How, how did it feel to make theater? Well, it was a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so you could really um, afford, you know, Robert's generally wildly generous rent and and put a show together. And you know, equity had limits on what you could spend and and you know how much did you spend? <laughs> I mean, I don't think anyone ever really kept the limit, but what was it? Do you remember like it was like ten or fifteen thousand dollars? What the rent? Oh, no, what, what no, no, sure? no, 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 what the limit was. That, that was that was posts. the limit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean we our our Adobe's first show, we spent seven hundred and fifty dollars. That was the budget. My limit was two thousand dollars. That's pretty good. Yeah. So I mean, you could do you could do it, and 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 we were all very young, so we were, you know, it was okay not to get paid for some period of time in the theater. You were kept your job, and you came when you could, and all that stuff was seemed much more doable then. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add, you know, now we've got these cell phones in our pocket. You know, if we want to make a movie. It's easy, um, and it, and kids don't want to do that anymore. They want to make TikToks, and they can do that, and they can express themselves artistically doing that. Back then, you didn't have that. So if you wanted to get together and do something 
fun, creative, kooky, different, interesting. What's our take on this? How would we do that? Um, this was a playground where we made that happen. I would also add just that uh, there was a lot more press coverage uh, down there than there is now. Yes. And I'm just thinking of, of all of us, but um, Adobe Theater had a run of like six, seven years of New York Times raves every show, year after year, show after show. And that sold tickets and people, you developed a following and, and you guys really, you know, became something that people anticipated and looked forward to seeing. and. Uh, and so there was there was a there was more press uh, in support of the work. And how was the theater work? Um, how was the relation to words, writing, playwrights, stage design, improvisation? Did you feel it was different then than it's now, or how did you approach your work? Well, for us, we were a, a company of actors, designers directors, writers, my, my feeling when I went into theater was the life that I didn't want was working really intently with a group of people for a month, six weeks, whatever it is, you know, falling in love, going into battle, and then leaving them and saying goodbye. That, I couldn't handle that at that point. And so I wanted a, a group that, you know, we're gonna do it again and again and again, it's the same group. And so we all did everything. I mean, yes, there was a set designer and, you know, lighting the, but we were all on ladders, hanging lights and painting and, you know, curtains and all of that. Um, but everybody did everything and everybody gave each other notes, you know, and that was just part of it is that we were creating it very much as an ensemble together. And it's not that you never have that experience, but at least for me, it was that, that's when that really happened. And that's where it really happened. Some of some of the actors, uh, Arthur Elise, I'm thinking of, was in that company, and he was recently in one of my shows, you know, two years ago or something. So, again, it's like these roots go so deep, and they circle around, and they circle around, and they circle around. What were complicated moments um, for you, Ohio, at the time in your work? <laughs> I mean, it, it was hard to get audiences. It, it always is. Um, the, the press helped and, um, you know, reputation that you built helped. But when you're doing new work and you don't have anybody, you know, any stars or fame, you know, any names anybody would recognize, um, it's tricky. It was tricky then. I think it, it may be trickier now. I don't know. Um, to articulate yourself to the community. Uh, you know, what is it that they're doing down there? Once you see it, you get it. But until you see it, you're kind of like, what? What is that? Um, I don't know, what else? You have to be oh. kind of creative in terms of, of audience strategy, right? Like we did a show called Waiter, Waiter, where um, it was about a group of waiters who kind of devolve into like cannibalism practically. And uh, we, <laughs> we, we got the word out that if you brought your corkscrew, you could get two for one. Mm -hmm. So all the waiters came to our show and we had a huge audience. We did, it was, Edward Zilga, one of the, our producers was, it was, I thought it was a fired idea and they came and they brought their corkscrews and we let them in. And, you know, word fire, we did two, we did two entrances. We did an early show and a late show, different performers and you could, you know, two for the price of one, but for some reason, we didn't get a lot of two for the price of one people, stayed if they could, but most people, you know, came when they could. And so we had two sets of admissions every night and that was useful and kept us afloat. In my experience, things get more complicated when technology comes in. Because I did do, um, Kristen Martin wasn't able to be here today, but she's another person who did a lot of work at the um, Ohio. And uh, later I was a, a here artist. I was in residence, a harp artist. And I used video in that production. In my early work, I had slide projectors with slides and that wasn't too complicated. But then once you have complex video, you need to have technically proficient people. And that's when the complications arise. Another time um, I did a show 
uh, staying afloat at the Ohio, and the firemen came. And the firemen came and held up the show for what, a half hour? It was, it was, you know, a full house. It was, it was completely full. It was, you know, I don't know. It was an audience I was happy to have. And they, everybody had to wait. And I don't think it helped to show that they had to wait a half hour. But anyway. I think that was part of the fun. Yeah, well, like that maybe happens, so. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, that's a very old Ohio kind of thing. There was no air conditioning. No air conditioning, right? Yeah. That kind of... The fire department was like our enemy. And we were like, uh, they would come every once in a while, but um, we were certainly not up to code. And anyway, there's a lot of stories around that. But uh, it made me laugh when Karen mentions the fire in the basement in the, in the thing that you read, because I don't even remember that particular fire. That was, uh, I don't either. Yeah, I don't know. There, there, there are a couple, and uh, so anyway, the uh, fire department was uh, was not our. Mm -hmm. So you got the word out with flyers, I guess, like in the music bands. You know, you would go around um, and put up. You know, put them in the bar in the window at the bar down the street, and people, you know, and it was Soho too. So there was an actual community. And people knew the companies, and people came to Soho to go to the theater. And there was Soho News as well as the Village Voice, which That's both right. which reviewed as well as the Times. Yeah, those were the so, two big reviews. That yeah. Did, did your work had a political context? Did you feel that was a political? Was it anti-broad? What, what, what was that kind of? You felt it had a mission. It had a an ideological context. At least for. For us, it was really only in as much as it was an opportunity for new work, which didn't exist much else anywhere else. But it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't against anything else either. It was just here's opportunity, here's stuff that they're not gonna put on, you know, uptown. And I think that's true for all of us. Yeah, I I think that's true. I mean, so up, up there, we, we can hear you. Not so loud, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Robert, if, a question for you. Was there um, a manifesto? Was there something where you felt this? Uh, a manifesto for this space? Uh, not, not that was articulated. It wasn't something that um, I talked about. Uh, it was really, it was really um, just a certain kind of aesthetic adventurism that, uh, that was of interest to me. And, um, and once people came in, again, once people approached me about doing a show and then I'd see the show, I'm like, okay, I love this. Do you want to come, you know, and they'd say like, do you want to come back? And, I, and they'd say yes, and then they'd come back. So it really um, was kind of organically built rather than um, I had a manifesto or some specific idea that I was trying to do. It was really responding to um, the artists that um, in the work I was seeing and the relationships I was developing. And uh, so it had that, that's, that's kind of how it really happened. Good, so and then t speaking of uh, uh, changes and things, maybe go to the next panel, all the audience members who don't have a seat can find us. So let's say thank you. We could talk so much longer, of course, but leave the microphone on the chair and really, really thank you. Thank you. Sit in the middle. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, let's take this up. Melanie, Maria. No, I thought you were right there. If I can, if you don't mind. <laughs> So, um, so first of all, thank you all for coming as an audience, really taking time out of your for sure busy lives on such a beautiful day. But it's really a great, a great thing. I think honoring today also uh, the Ohio and creating an archive. It is live stream, but also recorded. So, um, thank you for coming. And uh, everybody knows who you are, but still maybe a few uh, words about you, who you are, and your name, and...
Uh, um, my name's Maria Stryer. I am the uh, artistic director of Club Thumb. We were more or less in residence at the Ohio for a clean decade from uh, 2000 to 2010. I think I produced over 30 plays there. In That's that what time. I'm talking about right there. I'm Susan Burnfield. I'm the artistic director producer of New Georges. Um, we were the same decade, pretty much, uh, off and on, right? 2000, yeah, uh, off and on, more off and on at the Ohio Theater. I think we produced 10 shows there. I'm also a playwright who was in the Ice Factory Festival, so yay. Hi, I'm Melanie Joseph, um, and I would just, she's a wonderful playwright. Um, and I, for 25 years, was one of the leaders of the Foundry Theater, and I, which I founded in 94. So thank you. So let's very simply, what did the Ohio mean to you? Maybe we start with you since you said you don't want to start, but Susan, what did the Ohio mean to you? It, oh, so much. I mean, it, it, it meant I was cool. <laughs> I, I I wasn't cool. I, I the first time I went to the Ohio, someone <laughs> maybe I cooler. I I um I, I was producing Uptown um on Theater Row and someone told me that you're doing this work, but really you should be downtown and you should go to the American Living Room, uh, which is this thing at the Ohio Theater, which I'd never heard of. I'd never heard of any of the people involved in the American Living Room. And so I was like, okay. And I took my little piece of paper that said 66 Worcester Street and I went down. And as I got to Worcester Street, I saw these crowds. And I thought, how am I going to find the theater? There's crowds on this street. I don't know how I'm ever going to find this American living room. And it turned out the crowd of these cool people were aligned to get into the show. And I had never experienced anything like that. I was like, something's happening here. And and where I am, I, it's just dorks. And I and I don't I don't know. I just wanted to be part of it so much. And um, and it was a great show, and I sat what on the What was the show? What did you see? Well, it was, there were three pieces, and um, and I remembered one of them. I actually did a piece about it when we did that, like, Club Thumb did a, the Ohio is closing, do a piece about the Ohio thing, and, and the one I remember was this dance piece. Um, but I don't know, it just was about being in that space and feeling the community, which I really hadn't felt before, even though I've been producing for a couple of years. Um, and then I um, was, we were in residence at Soho Rep for a while with Adobe, and then Adobe moved to the Ohio and Adobe was cool. So I wanted to follow Adobe to the Ohio. And finally in 2000, we did a show um, in the Ohio. And, and also before that though, I went to the RAC conference. I don't know how many people remember the RAC conference. And we sat yeah, with Catherine, and and we sat at a table. I remember I, the barn doors were open, and um, and there was this conversation going on. Kristen was there. I'm sure Robert was there. And I just remember thinking, I'm in the center of the universe. Like Soho is here. I'm in the biggest space on Earth. I'm just sitting here in a conversation. I just want to spend every minute of every day here. Later, I had more community, and we played poker in that same spot with the doors open. And um, and it was amazing. And as Jeremy said, you could make you, you walked in and then you could make your dreams come true. And you had so much resource in terms of what the vision could be, in terms of what the space could be. Even if you didn't put a lot in there, it still was exciting. And it really felt like possibility all the time and that you could do so many things that were expansive that I feel like now that we all have to do things in less expansive spaces, I still feel like I respond to space in a different way because of having had that experience. What was the first work you produced? Uh, we produced a play called Imagining Shadows that was very, very difficult and kind of a disaster. But the second pr play that we produced, what? Oh, okay. Uh, was called Eloise and Ray, and that was amazing. It was, and we had the, it, it took up the whole space. It had this incredible Marsha Ginsburg set that had sand in, in it. And um, do you really want the whole stuff? Whatever. Okay. So there was, it was all sand. And she would come in every couple of days and say, more sand, more sand, because it was rubbing off. She would bring her dog. And, and so we kept putting more sand on it. And then no one could show up to strike. And I had four, 40 <laughs> by 20 feet of sand and walls, or they could come to, they could come, and anyway, and Sarah Cameron Sunda, who worked with me, she came to strike, but she had to move that day. 
And so she was like, well, if you help me move, I can be there the whole day. So we took two hours away so I could drive all of her stuff from the West Village to 108th Street. And then we came back and I just, and all I was doing was like scooping up the sand and we had uh, those things, containers uh, outside, dumpsters and the sand dumpster, sand dumpster, sand dumpster for 12 hours. I was six months pregnant. And that explains a lot. But anyway, it was very, it was really, that's what you did. You just had to do it. You had to take everything down. You had to put everything there. You did every single thing you had to do. And every time we walked in and loaded in, it was impossible. And every time we loaded out, it was impossible. And yet we did it. And that, you know, those were the days. Maria. Um, well, it's true. I mean, as everybody said, like your design conversation was started already by those marvelous floors, by the height of the ceiling, by those, uh, by the barn doors in the back and by the uh, columns. But designers always wanted to like take it to the next step. I mean, we were always trying to rig these and we had no money and, you know, to pay people or for stuff, but we were always doing like these like preposterous things, like creating like 20 foot long tables that would like fly into the ceiling and come back like with no rigging systems. I mean, you know, it was definitely a place where I feel like- Shaky I, grid too. Uh, yeah, yeah, you would see it really kind of, I mean, it was, it was nutty and you know with um an electrical system that was known i mean that was one of the fires i remember uh was a little something in the booth <laughs> and you know ceilings that sometimes leaked and uh but you you could like get inspired and get ambitious um uh really easily uh, in that space in terms of um you didn't have to have a lot of money to like do something kind of bold looking but one of the things when you talk about this, I was thinking about the shows. We did, I think, three or four. I, we did lipstick. First one was Hot Mouth, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then it was Lipstick Traces. Then it was the Myopia. Major Bang. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Major Bang. Amazing shows. And, you know, there was always the potential of things falling apart. Always. And if you wanted to like lower something from the ceiling, very often the thing would drop. Or if you, there was a f fire somewhere, if, if some you could smell the smoke in the birth in the booth, oh my God, nobody ever in my experience was angry about what went kaflui. It was just normal, you know. It was normal. It was normal. It was. It there wasn't any other place in the city like this honest to God, there really wasn't. And because you just had freedom, you truly had freedom. And so that meant your your designers had, everyone felt the freedom that worked there. And it wasn't even like, look at the freedom I'm giving you. You know, the best thing about Robert is he gives you the keys. Mm -hmm. The greatest, greatest gift of any theater I've ever worked on. Here's the keys. Oh my God, I, I just could weep thinking about it. So I, I just wanted to follow you up and say, yeah, everything was a mess and that was normal. I, I think just a little context for this because <laughs> it's all true. Uh, it, it's all true. Uh, but par part of what I think that the cumulative effect of what you're hearing is that I also had no, you know, we had no money and, and we'll talk about this maybe later about the relationship of the landlord and the space. So we had this amazing space, but we had no money and, and no lease. And uh, so um, the way things improved was I had people who were coming back show after show year after year. And they would say, I just remember uh, Lenora Doxy saying, Hey, would it be all right if I like secured this part of the grid over here? Um, you know, because it's getting kind of wonky. And I'm like, yeah, thanks. And then somebody would say, oh, well, I, you know, I, I have this lighting board. I'm going to, you know, do you, do, you, do you want it? Everybody was actually helping us to fix the space up because they were coming back later that year. And then they were coming back the year, the next year and the next year. So uh, it wasn't like we got the big grant from the city and then we got all new equipment, although we finally did that eventually. Do you um, remember when um, I think uh, David Herskowitz uh, like Target Margin was doing something on an equity contract and there needed to be a bathroom that wasn't shared with the audience. Yeah. And and so that they, they built a little bathroom 
And that was like, that was such a game changer, like that you that didn't have to great. like go out there. Cause I also acted in a bunch of shows at the Ohio and like, you know, take your makeup <laughs> off, like while in line with the people who had just seen the play. Yeah. I, I, remember, it, the, I remember that well. The new chairs and how before there were those flip up chairs. So when you were having tech and you're having quiet time and we'd just go, boom, someone would get up, boom, boom, boom. And then there were the new chairs, which are still in the old. Uh, so it, it it was like a, a community project, actually. It was not about, uh, but everybody, what the only thing I would say is everybody knew what they were getting and um, they got it, so. But it was, you know, it feels like things are so slick now and it shouldn't, not that everyone thinks should be gross, but, but you know, you went back to that back thing and then you went to visit you in your office and then you still didn't sign the contract or anything which was great and and we you know it was you were living there and Amelie's desk was there and you'd have these conversations and I remember when I was doing the show with Lenora and I had this three-month-old baby and I just left it in the back in the thing and in, during the show in the office yeah just if, the other the other fact is <laughs> where I ended up uh living in the building on the third floor above the theater um for 18 years and uh, so that was also part of it that there was a very thin membrane between work <laughs> work life's uh, balance there was, it was just one thing um and so i was always around or could always be around so that, that was one thing that so you lived above your circumstances i did yeah, yeah. yeah. very fortunately yes I have a very clear memory of we were doing like a, a sort of a futuristic train, a play which involved like a futuristic spiral tr train track. And we had, um, it was an ambitious design and we had, you know, had to try and cut some corners, but we got some really great like silver paint, but it turned out to be like radiator paint. And not only do I think we all got some brain damage from painting it, but we managed to like get fumes going up all the way through the building. And I really didn't think we would ever get invited back into I didn't even think we were going to be allowed to do this show. The people in that building were so mad at us. I remember. It was a, <laughs> it was a place of great learning. <laughs> but I also remember, Maria, uh, is like this slop sink. Like for some reason, you were very uh, uh, interested in the organization of our slop sink. And whenever you guys would come in, you would like rearrange it and order it, organize all the paint. Uh, I, I, and I would appreciate have it, but clean example, the refrigerator and, and clean the refrigerator. But there was that kind of spirit, like everybody came in and instead of complaining about what was wrong, um, people tried to uh, fix it, or solve it or work around it. And I would say that was part of the spirit of it. What, what makes this place so different listening to you? If you look at new buildings like the Perlman, 600 million, um, one doesn't feel fully welcome. I went to a tour and they said, we have to bring the community to us. We have to have, get them here. A lot of Lenape actually, but they said, well, that was the building about, but this is a place where you would not say, let's bring the community because the, you are part of the community. The very radical difference, you know, that it was the, con it is the community. So, um, so it's something that um, uh, is New York City's theater, and I think it's something we have to preserve and also to honor. It's something so unique and uh, valuable. So tell us a little bit more about the productions, maybe, or if, if you want to comment on it, but what are Melanie, your productions? What did you do? Why would you say, I'm, I'm going to do this piece at the Ohio and not in other places? Because you, all three of you, if you're right, you don't have buildings, right? You chose, which is very interesting, to produce and then go to places. 80% of your budget didn't go to buildings. I just want to respond a little bit to what you just laid out. And, and just to remember that the, these, this theater, this building, was before the real estate monsters got hold of it. Okay? And that's why there was room. There is not any room in theaters in the same, or there isn't room in theaters in the same way because everyone's so panic-stricken about paying their bills. And I think it's, I think they're, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer to it, God knows, but I think it's important to remember what that, what that flavor of capitalism was at this theater versus what it is 
now. So in the years that we were there, it was it was churning. It was definitely churning. I remember when I went to Metropolitan Hardware to get all that sand uh, with my truck, my little bit of hand truck or whatever, I'd be like dodging the people with their shopping bags. And I loved that because it did feel like a little bit of a, a pushing back for so long. And, and like, how could we, you know, and producing in the few years when we weren't sure what was going to happen, you know, and, and I remember calling Robert all the time, like, are we going to be able to do our show, you know, in 2009, 2010? And, and it, it, it felt, I don't know, so encroaching, but at the same time, being able to be there in the middle of that encroaching capitalism felt so powerful to open those barn, door, barn doors and the people who didn't know what was going on got to see you up on your ladder. Got to, I remember doing, when I was at the Ice Factory Festival, all the interns were barbecuing burgers out on, on Worcester Street and, and everyone had to go around them. You know, it was so marvelous and, and lost. I was lost. in Italy that summer, didn't know that was happening. <laughs> you were, you were away. You know, uh, uh, Susan, you might also, uh, Susan, uh, New Georgia's had to show during 9-11 yeah. that was in the space. And so that was and quite, was in it. Yep. and you were in it. So that was quite, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was pretty rough. I mean, it was a show with 11 people in it. Maria was in it and it had opened the night before. It opened on the 10th of September. So I woke up a little late and I lived downtown also. And so we, we came back again on Friday, I think <laughs> like our director was, she was mad we missed some shows actually. And 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 we came back on Friday and that was the night that everyone was doing the candle um, ceremony outside. So we all, our cast stood outside and then we did the show. And I just emailed everyone I knew to say, look, we're doing this show. It was about community. It was about um, a, a small town that is essentially awaiting um, the, a, a sighting of the Virgin Mary and who comes together. So it was kind of, peculiarly apropos in terms of its beauty and, and what it was about. And so I wrote everyone. And then on the Sunday after 9-11, all of a sudden I saw all these people come up the steps, you know, come in the door. You know, I was sitting there alone like I had been for the other two performances. And they just started coming up the steps. And it was because like heeding the call of having to have this again. And it was really very moving. And yeah, and we did our show. And then the very last performance, it was mobbed. And we just had, you know, fire code breaking bit of a crowd but yeah the thing I remember about doing that show is there were you know so there were all there were a ton of us in it and there was a very long stretch toward the end where we all had to be um sort of very very silently moved from the back of the space to the front of the space which was kind of impossible because it had these old wooden floors um and um and so we're all sort of like creeping around and the the couple of days uh especially after 9-11 we were all you know all freaked out. Um, and of course it smelled, you know, so intensely down there at that time. And, um, and it was so quiet. It was so quiet. I'm not even sure they had cars on those streets um, for those days. Like you could get past off, it yeah. eventually. And just like yeah. trying to like tiptoe in that in uncanny, uncanny silence. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, it still gives me a little goosebumps. Yeah. I mean, the exact context uh, I remember was that when it, when it happened, they they put the, the boundary at uh, Houston first, and right. then so we were inside, so we we couldn't do any theater because they we were um, within you know you had to pass through a military checkpoint to get to the building, and um, it came down. They moved it to Canal Friday morning, mm -hmm. and then that was the decision, like right. to do the show or not, and the overwhelming. Thing was yes and i just i remember sitting in a circle with the ensemble yeah, making that circle. collective mm -hmm. decision and commitment to doing the show and that was friday you know that's tuesday this is friday it's so friday i, I know we had one actor who was like we should be going up to you know do the things that are helpful that no one could do because there was no one to help and um and so we decided to do the show I'm going to try to answer your question, which is um, why the Ohio? And I think part of the reason is that um, I discovered that there was a po there was a politics there. He had a co he he had a company. I just lost the name. Soho Think, Soho Think, Think Tank, and he was interested in some of the things that the foundry was interested in, and interested in exploring the sort of the the larger spectrum of what what goes on beside theater, not besides theater, but beside theater. And um, I think we kind of hit it off in 
in the discussion and the discovery of our appetites, our political appetites and inquiry. And um, and so the first show we did there was um, a show called Hot Mouth, which was an, a magnificent piece of work um, made primarily by Grisha Coleman. I don't know if you all know her or knew her. And it was a very political piece. It was a piece about race, I suppose one could say, but it was deeper even than that, if there is anything deeper than that, I'm not sure. And um, it just felt situated. We were situated in a place that allowed for what we were doing in a certain way. And in those days, this was the very beginning of the foundry time, um, Cornell West was my first board member and came to the show at the Ohio. And uh, he'd never been there. He never knew it existed, ever. You know, and it's he just he's always so happy about it. You know, went oh look at this, look at this, <laughs> and um and I said and I had the keys in my coat pocket, and I said these are the keys. He gives you the keys, and he was super quiet and he went look at that, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> anyway, so I, it I was gave, I gave the keys because we didn't have any staff. I, so that was the that was uh, that was the option, and, and just to pick up on it a little bit, you know, yes, if there was a political or there was a political agenda, you know, for my company, so think tank, there was in my own writing. I'm I, I'm a playwright director, and uh, I, I do think about politics, and I write about politics all the time, but it but it didn't extend as a manifesto for the space, so that was that's the distinction I would make there, and and I think that there was a in my mind, there was a general, uh, you know, the, operating outside of the capitalist system, like we were all doing in a certain way, uh, was what was the political action that was true about everybody who, who was working there, and, and the commitment to make work outside of monetary rewards uh, was in itself a kind of uh, resistance, and that's the way I saw it. But that wasn't something that was a manifest. You know, that that was uh, that wasn't written down anywhere that was just more vibe I would say. Um, i'm kind of obsessed by golden ages and i think that now that there's so much distance when i look back especially when i talk to people and i'm like well did you ever get to go to the ohio and they're like no no and, and that it was such a golden age i mean the work going to see everyone's work the work you were like what we did, seeing how people used it and, and being so in community. I think that's what I really mean by cool, like being getting to be a part of that, that community, um, learn, meeting people who you saw there. And um, when you went to see other people's shows, which was really as much what it was about as doing our own things there, it felt like we were all responsive to each other in so many ways. And, and, it, and because that kind of space just so sadly, I, I don't, I don't know how, you know, it just doesn't exist it, it, in a way that we could never have known then or understood then. It, it, it feels like so halcyon, such like amazing days. Not to be like really depressing, but also how lucky we were. It was, it was great. I feel very fortunate. We just have to rebuild New York City, everybody. Yeah. Tell us about some of your work, what you did there, and how did you react to the space? Um, well, we do uh, new plays, and uh, so we did like a shit ton of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we do a lot of the stuff in the context of a, of a sort of a festival, sort of a truncated season, and um, we never uh, chose to have any rep design, so we would sort of ramp it. We, at the time, I think we were doing, we would run things for like four days, and for, for two of those nights after the show, we would put in the set for the other thing and tech it. I mean, it was preposterous what we were doing. Um, and I spent, you know, very nearly all of 24 hours there for, you know, many, many days in a row. Um, but uh, in that time, I mean, we did, I think, the New York premieres of plays by Sarah Rule, by Jordan Harrison, by Adam Bach, by, and you know, a lot of the sort of first gigs designing by people like Mimi Lean. I mean, you know, it's, you know, for my chapter, it was like we went from being a new theater company to maturing a little bit and, um, and uh, brought like a lot of, 
you know, a certain sort of generation of, uh, of artists with us as we all figured out what the fuck we were doing. Um, but yeah, I think probably over 30. You also have those amazing opening the festival parties that brought yeah. so many people together and use the whole space like that downstairs area. I mean, you use the whole space. At the yeah. Place. I mean, it's like that, bit, that, that, that architecture, like that, like it was grand. I mean, it was sort of tawdry and a little dilapidated, but it was grand. And I think that that's, you know, that's a real rare opportunity. Um, and it's, it is inspiring. And so we tried not only, you know, to use it in varied ways and varied ways sort of right up against each other for our more fully produced work, but also we would try and extend the opportunity to as many people as possible in like really short terms. A lot of very scrappy things. Um, you activated the space, the kids say no. Oh yeah, all right. I mean, why, why this theater also is interesting, of course, it's as a production model, it's run by an artist who is a playwright and also a director. He is in charge, not a board or not, uh, you know, someone who studied uh, performing arts management, you know, and uh, worked, with, worked with budgets, nothing against it, but just it's a different model and it worked. And then he has companies like these three, all these three extraordinary artistic leaders next to me, one of the most significant companies in New York City in the field, you know, then they come and show their work. You organize it and they can come back to like, a, in a way, like a dolphin, they swim together, they come back, but it was a space that that come and that worked. It worked to create an audience. It worked to create theater. It worked to create a community. It worked to activate in a way that the neighborhood for the people who live there say, oh yeah, I live next to the Ohio, you know, I can go there. So it was what the Whole Foods now claims to be, you know, to uh, uh, to do it. So I think it's an incredibly interesting and important model. And some one, one has to look very careful when one thinks where in, is theater going. And um, of course it's, you know, it takes people like Robert um, to do it and put it together. But I think it's a successful model. Robert, tell us a little bit, how did you choose the people? I know you will say they just came to me, but Still, how did how did it happen? You were well, discerning. I remember that it was sort of like uh, yeah, a thing I mean, to get the thumbs I up. I did care what was in the space, but did you ever say no to people? Y yes, <laughs> uh, but uh, a couple things. You know, it, the space uh, as you're getting as everybody's hearing was quite spectacular, even in its decrepitude, <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of demand for it. So uh, that created. Uh, that gave me the space to um, curate a little bit, right? Because, and um, people wanted to be there, so then I, I could, I could make choices. Um, I feel like, how did I make decisions about it? You know, it's really once people came in and um, I saw the work and and developed a relationship. I, you know, what I was gonna say is, I, there was a certain point with different groups of people, but like to make the schedule, I, I would go like, hey, Susan. Uh, how many shows you want? How many weeks do you need? You know, Maria. Maria kind of had June all the time because she had the summer works. And you know, like I would make a few calls and say, uh, "How much space do you need? When do you need it?" And I would gather that information and then I'd hammer a schedule out. And I'd go back and forth and say, "Can you move two weeks up or can you do this and that?" And everybody was okay to do that because they all knew each other and they knew they were making space for each other anyway and helping each other else work. And then within you know a week, the season would be like hammered out with these four or five, you know, five, six groups. Um, and that would go again like year after year. So then maybe one group would leave, but some another group would step into that role. And then there were always new companies that came in and did one show. That was all, you know, that happened, of course. But the, the bones of the schedule every year was a series of phone calls basically began as a series of phone calls. Um, and I do, I, there, you know, there's a few people, you know, we're going to, we're going to transition to the uh, new Ohio in the next meeting, but there's a few people I have to uh, just call out here that uh, could not be here today, but were important parts of the space there. And that is Kristen Marty in Tiny Mythic it was a huge, uh, important right from the beginning, 1988. Um, that was like for six years, five years before she founded here, Art Center, and that juggernaut. Uh, David Herskovitz, Target Margin, they were there for like seven years. They were doing great work and they were with us all the time. 
uh, Kevin Maloney, we spoke about Tweed. Josh Fox and International Wow did some amazing sh shows that were really important um, over about a five-year period of time. Rachel Chapkin, the team, uh, was was there for over you know four-year spans. Rachel Dickstein, Ripe Time, Sam Bagellan, Mai Yi, uh, Undermain, Talking Band. So, you know, there were these are all people who couldn't make it here today, but it's important that they get mentioned in this, what we're describing, because they were also part of it in, in the long arc of the space. Truly, um, truly um, extraordinary. Um, we, we did an event here for Harold Pinter when he died. We were actually the only people uh, who did something in the city as so often with Pina Bouchers and others. And uh, Matthew Burton, who worked with him, said Harold Pinter only was also a great playwright because at the time he had producers who said, whatever you do, we're going to produce you. And he said that every, only every third or fourth or fifth play was really great, you know. But he said he couldn't have done his work, you know. And of course, in a way, with the company also, they, there was a place that, yeah, I'm sure, did you ask for the script or what they were doing before? No, you said, I know you do, you give you the space, right? It was definitely, we were definitely, uh, I was supporting artists, not projects. Can so. you imagine? I mean, so now you have to all write about, proposals. And, and, and that, that, that's a good segue, actually, into the archive. Right? Yeah, so let's move over to the next panel. Thank you so much, really. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more chairs. That's all right. So, we, how many more mics do we need? No, 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 that's fine. Probably one. Thank you. Hello? <laughs> Thanks. So, um, next round, um, Robert. Why is it a perfect segue? Well, um, it temporally. So that was that we were all talking about the Wooster Street, and it's very important. Uh, people are very sensitive that I not call it the there's the new Ohio Theater, and that it not become the old Ohio Theater. So <laughs> we call it the Wooster Street Ohio. <laughs> and the new Ohio, so that's important for people. Um, but I was just thinking uh, that was about supporting artists and not projects. So um, what the artists you're about to meet here are all took um, part in our archive residency program. So now we've lost the space on Worcester Street. Um, there's a uh, Kevin Cunningham at 3LD um, saved me when I had, when I was just in complete free fall, he offered me a desk in his at 3LD and said, you know, it kept me alive, basically. It kept me in business. Um, and we did one ice factory there. And uh, miraculously, uh, the space on Christopher Street opened up that same, at that same time when I was at 3LD. And uh, we got that space and we opened a year later that space um, as the new Ohio theater. And I couldn't, because of what you've all heard about the space, I couldn't call the space Ohio theater because it was, it, it, the space was so iconic. Um, but I wanted to bring all the history of the space with us, but not name it the same thing. So that's how we got the new one. Um, and anyway, so the transition, uh, I think everyone should introduce themselves, but, um, so, uh, archive residency is a two-year program where, um, artists come in with an idea and they develop it over two years and then we present it at the end of the two years. And um, it was really based, that that invitation was based on on who the artists are and uh, not what the project is. And so that was the transition for me. But let's let's introduce ourselves. Yeah, maybe you start to play for sure. who you are and then we go first and then we can do discussion. So we, but also for our viewers on all around. Great. Hi everyone, I'm Via Vrata Price and I am the founder and co-director of Taya Artistry. And we were the um, New Ohio IRT Archive Residency Company 2022 to 2023.
Hi, everyone. My name is Maropi. Uh, I'm a, one of the co-founders of Radical Evolution Performance Collective. Um, and we were, uh, our residency was a, uh, was a COVID extended residency. So I believe we started in 2018 um, and, you know, scheduled to, to culminate in 2020, um, but actually did our, um, our presentation, our sort of premiere show in uh, spring of 2022. Uh, I'm Normandy, um, co-artistic director of The Drunkard's Wife. Craig over there is the other artistic director. Um, we we were 2018, 2019. Um, so pre-COVID, we got the full experience in the amount of time. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm Alex Hare. I'm a writer-director. I work with uh, this gentleman over here and one other on a show called A Burning Church, which was in the archive residency, also extended 2019 to 2022. So we had some virtual programming, but we arrived back in the theater for the end of it. Hello, I'm Nehemiah Luckett. I am a composer, music director, music supervisor, music maker, music helper. Um, and yes, uh, that was our relationship with New Ohio. But I just have to add that I had a lot of, um, especially seeing all of these like beautiful images, memories of being at the Ohio also have been um, an important part of my New York City experience. And I, I came to New York in 2000, and I think it was September 13th or 14th, 2001, I was at the vigil that was not too far away. And that's when I kind of was like, oh, there's a theater here and then came to see some of the team productions and just saw a lot of things. And so it was really, both spaces are really important to me. Uh, Frank, let me just say, uh, cause I should have said earlier, the uh, archive residency uh, was a partnership with IRT theater and Corey Rushton is artistic director. I don't know if she was gonna try and make it. I don't know if she's here, um, but we would, we would develop work upstairs in her space. She was in the, in the same building on the third floor above us and then um, workshop it up there and then bring it down to the ice factory and then to the world premieres. But she was a crucial partner in all of that. Well then, same question to all you guys. Um, the new Ohio and Ohio without fires, I guess, was probably, but how, did, how what did this space mean to you? Anyone? Um, I'll just start real fast to say that I didn't know so much of that um, Ohio history, having come to New York 2009, 2010, but I think I had a strong sense that the new Ohio had, it was a place of integrity. And I looked at the archive residency in particular as a rare program in the indie scene that was multi-year that had money with it and resources and, and space and all that. So it was something that I highly desired to work, uh, be involved with. And I think originally, um, Jalen Levingston, who's our third collaborator on this, uh, he and I proposed a different project uh, and had an interview and didn't get it. And that is sometimes just the end of the process. And then very soon, Robert invited us to try something out in the Producers Club uh, sort of series. And that's when this uh, began. And so to me, it just feels like space, time, resources in, in a space, in a sector of this industry where you rarely have those things. I was marveling at the stories that were coming before and just how, you know, we're talking about the economics changing in New York and the just the vibe changing so dramatically and how little the my experience of New Ohio, the community there, and particularly of Robert, just were the same. Here's the keys, first day. Here's the keys. I was like, really? In this fancy building in, on Christopher Street? I mean, just, and and really also to the point of people, not projects, it was the archive was come and develop something. And we developed something for the ice factory. And I remember Robert saying to me, ah, oh, so you're gonna keep going with this? I was like, no, we're just gonna try something different for the world premiere. And he said, okay, <laughs> just totally okay. Was there at rehearsals, was there at the opening night of both the shows, their closing night. So just the deep um, belief in artistry and artists and community and art making is just something that is obviously a continued, continued thing with New Ohio, Ohio and Robert. Yeah, just to pick up on that, um, I think for me, uh, the having the space of the archive residency in the time was really just meant like um, a certain form of freedom to 
explore the kind of um, uh, wild, like kind of unhinged scale of the project that we were trying to put together um, in the residency itself. Um, and then also just how much Robert trusts artists. Um, you know, I'd be like, I think I wanna do, you know, this uh, show that has like songs from like, you know, 20 different eras and like seven different countries with like maybe eight people, I don't know, maybe 10, I don't know. And he's like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, and and just, yeah, like kind of the, um, you know, it was like uh, having someone that like sort of like thinks you can do it like almost before you think you can do it <laughs> is like such a huge thing. Um, and especially as somebody who, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a maker and divisor, and then I also produce the work. So, so often like I'd be at war with my maker self being like, how am I actually going to get this to occur? Um, and, and having the support of like, well, I know where I'm going to do it and I know when I'm going to do it. And, and just having that anchor, um, as we we're trying to figure out all the kind of like the rest of the unknowns was, was just, yeah, a huge thing. Um, and you know, uh, as a, as a developing company, you know, Robert was one of the first people who, um, invited us in and was, you know, gave us a platform. Um, so, uh, you know, it, now it's, you know, I, I, I look back on, you know, that, that call and, and, and kind of see how everything has sort of like flown from, you know, flowed from there, I guess I should say, um, in terms of, you know, how, you know, opportunities kind of beget other opportunities. So, yeah. Um, I guess I'll say, I feel like I also had a really, like a long run up to the archive residency because I also like Nehemiah and other people was going to the other Ohio, the <laughs> Wooster, Ohio for a really long time, like from the time, mm, a couple of years after I came here. And, um, and like had my eye on it a little bit. Like I, I liked the work I saw there. I liked the space. I liked the people. I have like a vivid memory of like in front of one show or another. I don't remember which one. Talking to the playwrights Thomas Bradshaw and Liz Merriweather, and we were saying we're going to start our own company called Three P, at that time, <laughs> and that we didn't. But um, <laughs> but just that that was sort of like you, you know, I'm this feeling of uh the community I wanted to be around, and then um. Uh, Robert and I went to graduate school together. Um, and then Brooklyn years, College. In Brooklyn College. Mac Wellman Mac, writing program. Um, and then years later, I CUNY. We, CUNY, <laughs> yes, CUNY. CUNY, Brooklyn. Um, uh, we did my company, The Drunkard's Wife, which Craig and I started uh, like our first sort of big production that was in a space that some was someone else's space, not a storefront space we were running, was uh, in the ice factory at the New Ohio, and uh, and then we really liked it, and we wanted to come back, and so we were really excited uh, when Robert invited us to um, join the archive residency because we were like, yes, we get to come back, we get to use this space, and you know, coming from a place of doing a lot of self-producing and making the theater ourselves in whatever space we had, it was like pretty nice to have the experience of coming into a place that it was, you know, there's a grid, there's it's set up to be a theater. And for the for the project that we were um, developing through the archive residency, which um, ended up being a collaboration with this folkloric dance company called Panambi Vera um, Paraguayan Folkloric Dance Company, um, it ended up having a lot of kids dancing in it and having a legitimate space to bring the parents of the kids to and have be, have them be able to watch the show. That turned out to be quite important too. <laughs> So let's focus, maybe you, you, all of you mentioned also residency, which is different than the producing, you know, something up. So tell us a little bit, how was that? How did a residency look like? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we had a couple of milestones along the way. Uh, so we, uh, like you had mentioned up at IRT with Corey Russian, we would have a uh, workshop and then we would do Ice Factory in the summer of that given year. There'd be another IRT and then there'd be a final presentation at two weeks or how, how, how? over to over two years, really. So kind of but like different seasons, years. right? The residency is go, went over two years. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how long and um, yeah. what were the steps? Well, for us, our steps were totally not that at all because of yeah. COVID. And so we we did go to IRT. Actually, it was probably February of 2020. And you all came and listened to stuff and people sang together. And that was nice. And then 
uh, we couldn't do anything. And so over the summer, we did a, a workshop of this musical remotely. And I love developing musicals. It's the thing I love to do the most. It's also a total nightmare all the time sometimes. <laughs> and doing it remotely can be really challenging. And maybe you can speak to that. But um, we did what we could. And it was under the new Ohio auspices. And we felt your presence, I think, remotely. Um, but it was just refreshing, finally, then to come back the next year and do um, this workshop. And I will say too, I think Robert was very patient with us. I think developing a musical, a full length musical uh, is a big undertaking. I think it takes seven years, it takes 10 years. I think for us, we would do a workshop of act one and we would throw out 90% of it. And then we would do another workshop of act one and we would throw out 70% of it. And I think what we ended up doing was a kind of staged workshop of a very long version of act one that we have subsequently thrown out 50% uh, of. Um, but just to feel like we didn't, we were supposed to have a world premiere, you know, at the end of this, but the world was strange. Um, and you allowed us to do what we did, which was, you know, a kind of hybrid thing, uh, putting it up on its feet, um, but still, you know, page bound a little bit and, and um, he's still, still working through it, I think. And, you know, we're still working on this show. We anticipate more years of, of work on it, but it just feels so shaped by being in an indie space. Um, I think we're trying to merge a sort of uptown sensibility with a sort of downtown thing and think, what does it mean to do a musical in, in your space? I think that has really left a mark and, and maybe uh, you'd say the same, Marofi. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say that I think that um, that flexibility uh, of, of process, even though like the residency had, um, you know, specific resources as, at specific times and certain milestones, um, within that there was a, a flexibility of process that um, I think is pretty unusual to find um, in theaters in New York these days um, in terms of, you know, how we wish to develop the work, what resources we wish to allocate where, um, you know, like what is, you know, yeah, what is our process around like how the material is getting developed and then where do we end up? I think, um, yeah, just like the openness that that you had to that, Robert, was really unusual. Um, I find that so often in theater uh, these days, you know, there's, there's almost like this like factory model of theater making of like it has to fit into these steps and it has to kind of you know operate according to this logic um and and there was just never that kind of demand and i think that um the, it also speaks to like the sort of breadth of like styles of work that i have seen as part of um the archive residency and of course also just the the larger arc of of work at the um at the new ohio i i also never had the, the the fortune to visit the the original Ohio, but um, but in the sort of thirteen years of the of the new Ohio, just the yeah the breadth and and the kind of difference in the work that you would see was really striking, including your own, because I got to see my onlyness in that space. I think it was one of nearing the last shows that got to be there, and a wild, amazing ride. And I thought, I'm Robert Lyons runs this theater and this is his piece. This is fucking cool. <laughs> it was so great. Um, and this just, just off the, I thought about John Rubin because I know that he did quite, quite a bit of work at Ohio. And I remember when I got the archive residency and I called him and I said, oh, I'm, I've got this the archive residency with New Ohio. And he said, Robert Lyons is the real deal. Tell us a bit, what about your work? What did you show? How did you approach your work in the space? Well, I think like everybody, we were, we're group devised. We're the company that Chuck and I, who would, who would be here if he could, so my co-director, were group devised, all kind of artist-led work. And so the first piece that we presented at the Ice Factory, same thing, we got to create it, work it, do it upstairs at IRT. And it was called Paradigm. And it was really a work in progress, but we then took some of the ideas, some of the characters, and really went to work and created a piece that I'm really proud of being Shaka. And I think that too was like one of the last, we were the last archive resident company, That's right? right? You were, yeah. yeah. So it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was a piece about, um, race, about the personal dynamics of race, about the introspection of what happens when the systems are oppressive and how we make meaning of that. And it was an 11 person show and it was great, yeah. It's great. And it, it changed from flyers, I guess it was the beginning of constant contact and yeah. Uh, yeah. patron mail. How, did, uh, Robert, how did, was that a different? Did you have more audiences, less? Or? 
was it just a different meaning? Well, one of the things you're hearing, you know, I think subtext here is a little bit is like the new space actually um, didn't leak when it rained. Uh, we put in an HVAC system. It was air conditioned. It had heating. So uh, nice big columns. Yeah. Still have, we still had the columns, though. That's true. We brought the columns with us. Uh, so so New Ohio had uh, why I, I really love this space uh, as well in its own way. It was very different, but it was more. Uh, user friendly, I would say, um, and and we had more equipment, we had more staff, and we had more, you know it was more of a uh, it, we were, to whatever little degree we institutionalized it happened there more than on Wooster Street. Mm -hmm. um, is it also why today I had the feeling the earlier panels that this was the piece and we made it. This was it. This is it. We develop, we show, we come back. One detects a different fluency in in work you know is it did, was that uh, something Robert did you present repeatedly work is that did something change from the piece to kind of uh, in between stages of pieces that uh, yeah they changed a lot and uh, I think you know I because I, because I think of myself as an artist primarily and first uh, I'm always on the side of the artist and uh, so when the artists tell me what they want to do I'm like okay that's it so there was never, um, uh, it, it, was a, it was a very light touch in terms of what the work, how, where the work would go and how it would go. And um, uh, I just kind of, they would try things and then they'd learn and then they'd say, okay, well, based on what we learned, this is where we want to go. And I'd be like, great, uh, you know, and so, yeah, the work evolved a lot, as you're hearing a lot. You know, some people ended up doing completely different shows by the time they got to the end of the program, like completely different shows. Um, some people, some people didn't. Some people found their groove at the beginning and then refined it, and then they stayed with it, and that became their piece. So, it was it was very specific to the group and the artists and and their process, basically. At the beginning of our residency, because um, I was brought in a little late in the process, and I think we had a few weeks before we were having our first workshop, so um, we had like a deadline, and there was an, an idea of what we were doing, and suddenly we had 10 songs, and we just kind of made it happen for that first production, um, or for the first reading, and we came back in February 2020 and things happened. Um, and once we got around to our virtual workshop, it was amazing because we, you know, obviously it wasn't the same as having the keys, um, but we felt a, a freedom to do whatever we needed to do. And there was also at this, it's so strange. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to like pull the memories back. I think I'm like tamping them down, but there was such a sense of, is anything happening? Will anything happen again? What is going on? And to receive the phone call or the email saying, you know, if you're up for it, we're up for it. Like, let's see what we can do. And as Alex was alluding to earlier, trying to do musical theater uh, virtually during this time was very difficult. <laughs> and I think that we did end up like pushing our date back a couple of times just because as we were realizing what we were wanting to do and how we would need to do it, we were just needing more time. Um, and it was just, there was always such grace with like, yeah, what do you need? Like, whatever you need, like, this is here for you. We're here to support you. We're here to support this work. And it just felt, um, one, like a gift to be able to do something, uh, even though I was drowning in 20 tracks for, at that point, 25 different songs from 12 different singers, five musicians, and getting that all put together was, a lot, but I also felt like that was such a learning for me. And now, and I was always a live theater, live music maker. I never really cared 
about recording. So suddenly I had to learn a lot. And now I'm releasing my second pop soul album in July, thanks to the things I learned working on this project. <laughs> and I would just add to that on the subject of sort of artistic freedom. Um, it, it felt like you know, this is a show where there's a conflict um, that's happening inside and outside a church. And some of the things that we ask actors to do in this show are very fraught. People are singing the praises of Jesus and people are mocking Jesus and people are speaking tongues and someone is in drag as their mother, who's a uh, first lady of the church. And then it becomes a striptease and just uh, all sorts of things happen. And it can be very fraught sometimes when you get a group of actors together, some of whom are Christians avowedly, some of whom are atheists. And, you know, the three of us are on all sorts of the, the spectrum here religiously. Um, it just felt like that is sometimes fragile, and we felt like the, it was the right ecosystem for that, um, and that's something that we're looking for a, as we move forward here. Um, one thing I kind of want to pull out, I think, that's coming up in this panel and like in the one before is just like something about creating the space to do something really big. I, I'm thinking about that because I think that's what we, every time we were allowed into the new Ohio, we tried to fill it with a lot of people and a lot of stuff like was, we always want to do. Um, but just like, you know, being open to that, being open to like, of course, you can have 25 children come be in the show. Of course, you can have a full band. Of course, you can fill the space with cardboard like. Um, uh, that, that, that I think is like, uh, in the last panel, uh, people were talking a little bit about how that sense of space is shrinking and that like to hold like a space where you are allowed to do something big and you, you do do something big by whatever your lights are. Um, I, I think that was a really pretty special thing about it. I, th I think that's, uh, I, I mean, the, the Christopher street space although it was very different than the Worcester Street space, actually was big enough that you could. You could put one person on, but you could put 25 people on that stage or 12 or however. And and um, I think people liked that and took advantage of it. So I, lo I personally love that too. Yeah, and how the space also got activated. I remember the Schimmelfennig play where the lobby, you know, was integrated, you know, into the piece. It already started once you came in. Um, so it was quite a unique um, 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 feeling to then, even so sometimes it's not so easy to find the numbers to at the door, you have to <laughs> press um, the code or whatever. It was very different. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, um, Robert, um, a question, the, the big barn door was open. You looked at the street, this was more inside. Um, did it feel different or did it create new possibilities because it was more focused? Uh, I, I mean, I, I could respond to that in this way in that, you know, I, I had a very different relationship to the space, obviously, and, and on Worcester Street, I was on the third floor and this was on the first floor. And, uh, and so again, it was, it was seamless uh, life and work and uh, whereas um, this was, this was just a more traditional relationship to the space. I had a lease, uh, you know, I had air conditioning and, and heat i had i had things like that and uh fewer fires no we had zero fires we are up to fire code the fire uh, we could invite the fire department at any time and so uh i think that changed my i was also in a different part of my life uh i was also working at sarah lawrence college uh, we have some sarah lawrence people christine farrell here who i worked for and um, so it was a different, you know, it was a, it was a different. You can hear the difference, I think, of the Worcester Street discussion, and this is a little more structured. And, and in a way, that was that was honestly that was a relief to me, you know, that that, that the city had moved, the things had moved, and um, and I had moved, and so it was it was different. One thing that I did just want to sort of connect though as a thread was the the kind of like community building aspect of like the 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 way that the space was run made space for us to you know relationship build during our processes to you know yeah bring in the the people that we wanted at the times that we wanted and needed and um just to acknowledge that for radical evolution like um many of our closest collaborators are folks that we found uh, you know, and started collaborating with during the archive residency and who, you know, are now a huge part of the, the life and work of the company today. Yeah. 
maybe we segue. We could go to the next panel. Really, thank you all, and um, and let's. Uh, uh, wait, wait. I, I I have my list though. I have to I have to do this. Yeah. I feel like I'm putting things into you know uh, into the official document, uh -huh. but some just I want to I want to list uh, all our resident uh, all the artists all the companies that went through our program, uh, the Mad Ones, Collaboration Town, Lee Sunday Evans, Radiant Bloom, Vampire Cowboys, Blessed Unrest, Jessica Burr, The Assembly, uh, Nick's here, um, Our Voices. Uh, Chuck is going to join us in the next one. His play was was developed in this program. Uh, Pie Hole, Anna Dota, Built for Collapse, The Drunkard's Wife, One Eight Theater. That's Daniel Rosari who did the, who has been my collaborator now, and um, we did three shows now. But uh, My Onlyness was the one I think people were talking about. Um, Radical Evolution, Byzantine Choral Project, Kareem Lucas, uh, Burning Church, which we talked to in TRs. And that was the that was the list of companies. Uh, it's a pretty yeah, uh, it's a pretty good list. Yeah, I would say so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's all right. We'll take. So we go to the next round. All right. Hey, how's everybody doing, everyone? This has been a long. Uh, everybody, everybody's with it. All right. So just to, just to, we've got one more uh, thirty minute, and then we're taking a fifteen minute break, and then uh, Frank and I are going to talk. This right? is like on Netflix yeah. binge watching. Oh, yeah, we're, we're we binging. love it. It's we're good. binging through the history. So the, Chuck, um, Tina, Alex, and Dan. Yep. Yep. Huh? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Good to see you. I saw you slipped in there. Sorry. Thanks for being here. Okay, we got one more. Here we go. So, um, again, thank you all for coming. Another, I think, really, really uh, great panel. Um, let's follow the same uh, uh, procedure. Also, for our viewers on HowlRound. Maybe introduce yourself um, in, a, in um, a short way, and then we come in to the question. Way, the big I'm, question: What does the Ohio mean to you? Right. So, Chuck. I'm, I'm Chuck. Me. I'm a playwright. I'm Alex Timbers. I'm a director, and when I was at the Ohio, I was also a writer. Uh. Um, excuse me. I'm Dan Rothenberg. I'm co-founder of Pig Iron Theater Company. I'm a director. Um, Tina Satter, playwright and director. And you should name the name of your company, Half Straddle. Oh, Half Straddle. And I'm artistic director of Half Straddle. Okay. Yes. Alex, your company. And I was artistic director of Le Fair Corbusier. Yeah. Um, for everyone who knows theater, knows this is an extraordinary panel and who knows if we see them all together in this configuration they will but still this is quite an extraordinary and it's of course because of the ohio um that we are here today and also that you work together so chuck maybe we start with you um you're also a colleague you taught a lot a long time also at columbia when it comes to the ohio is the opposite in a way of our structures we have here tell us a little bit what do you think of the ohio theater and the ohio old the new ohio and the well uh, I've had something done both at the old and the new Ohio. Um, and I, I love them both. I mean, I can't choose and tell you what was good and what was bad. I love them both. Um, and uh, the, the play that is mentioned with my name in the program uh, is a play that was tremendously inspired by Robert. Uh, I mean, not that he told me to do it or said do this, but that uh, I, w I was thinking about writing a play and thought, oh yeah, this is Robert. So that's, my play is about him as well as about somebody else. <laughs> I had no idea. Did you get go as an audience member um, to the Ohio? You know, what did you see? Yeah, sure. What do you remember the space entering the space? What do you remember? Well, I mean, mostly I remember 
a play of mine that was on there called Fête de la Nuit. And I can't remember the play, but I remember the theater. Uh, and the director? And I, I really loved it. I mean, beautiful I, piece. Yeah. It, it, yeah, the piece was thanks. But I, I remember really loving the theater. I loved that space. Um, I mean, I especially love uh, a terrible old black box theater uh, that isn't designed like a theater and doesn't work like a theater and uh, is a space that you can recreate in so many different ways and not have it be a set you designed that's then placed in a theater. Uh, so, I mean, that was the, the old Ohio was very much like that. Alex, um, tell us a little bit about the Freya Corbusier at the tank, at yeah. the Ohio. Absolutely. Uh, well, so I like sort of worshipped at the altar of the Ohio. I would see everything there. And all like the hero, my hero companies like Pig Iron and Adobe and Target Margin, like they were all there. And so then to get to be invited to be part of the ice factory was just this like felt like a like a huge professional and personal moment. And uh, and like Chuck was saying, and like it was uh, on the previous panel, like the space itself is such was such a character at the old Ohio and the opportunity for revelation of space for spectacle, for scale, um, it just offered up for sort of for free. And you were very generous in saying, you can flip the space, you can put actors in the lighting booth, you can, you know, anything like that was possible. You can cover the place in glitter. And, uh, and yeah, and so you, your mind ran wild. And uh, you were, the, you know, what's amazing about you as an artistic leader is it's the dream of every artist, right? To have a sort of yes and leader and, uh, and that's what the Ohio was. I, I remember in your first show in that ice factory, and it was um, the Franklin thesis, I think it was called. And there was a scene where Ben Franklin is inside of a glass case, and this and blood is poured over his head. Right. And the, yeah, that's and exactly the, right. The, yeah. Or he blood. was he. Uh, there was an academic suspended in a glass box with a live video feed projected, and Benjamin Franklin was evil, and yeah. he was time traveling and snorted, snorted a lot. Of Coke, and he had a giant Bible, like an oversized Bible, and he opened the Bible above the academic, and it was filled with blood, and blood poured all over the academic. Yeah, that's a classic moment of that, yeah. Um, so my company, Pig Iron, is based in, in Philadelphia, um, and uh, it was really important for us to bring work to New York. Um, those reviews and New York awards, I think, helped us raise money in Philadelphia, um, for sure. Um, when we were really just starting out, we were at Theater for the New City a little bit, which made the Worcester, Ohio look like a really well <laughs> outfitted situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was, you know, one bare bulb in the concrete floor sometimes. Uh, at, uh, at, but I've Love for theater for a new city as well, and then we we performed four shows there um, between 1999 and 2008. Um, yeah, that was uh, really critical for us, also in terms of making contact with other, um, even even having for the kind of work that that many of the people here make. You know, you don't exactly do auditions the way that you kind of need to make common cause with people. And so looking at the photographs, I'm also like, oh, and I remember, and I worked with him and I worked with her and, um, oh yeah, and I saw her in that show. Um, and so being able to not just show our work anywhere in New York, but a place where people who were interested in experiments and people who were interested in ideas, but also being willing to take a dump on academics, uh, I would say, um, you know, like sort of a, a hybrid of intellectual and anti-intellectualism, um, I think just allowed us to, to meet a lot of important folks um, who would become uh, designers who worked with us, or they would see us and say, we want to work with them. And now, um, now my theater company runs a grad program for devising in Philadelphia. And 
some of the grads of that program were part of the residencies uh, and performances at uh, the new Ohio. Um, which makes me think, I don't know if there's time for this, but you know, as someone who now teaches people who are 25, um, the struggle of explaining what New York was like in the 90s and how you really can't touch it anymore and that you could still kind of touch the 70s and 80s New York that we really admired um, from the open theater and the Worcester group. And um, yeah, I felt like, I don't think I could have said it at the time, but I feel like Robert's theater also was, a, there were fibers running back to the 70s and, and 80s. Um, and it's so hard. And, and so that you could still kind of get the the smell of the, of those collaborations and the influence of those. And it, it makes me wonder what, what you saw in the 70s and 80s that you were like, oh, I want to do, I want to connect to those guys or... I wasn't in New York then. I was, uh, yeah. I got to New York in '86. Uh, so that was, yeah. Um, but you should mention a couple of so the Pig Iron shows. If you don't know, Chekhov's Lizard Brain was was one of the great productions, and Hell Meets Henry Halfway. Yeah, Harry or Henry. Hell Meets Henry Halfway. Yeah, that was a Gombrowski. Uh, those are, those are two. Yeah, that was the tennis. Yeah, yeah that was the tennis one. Two two ma major productions, and just to give credit where it's due. Uh, Eric Youngworth, who uh, couldn't be here today, was a producing partner of mine, um, producing director back on the space, saw you guys in uh, Edinburgh, and he remember. said, oh, we should bring this show over. These guys are great. They're in Philly, and that's uh, uh, how you, that's how we I met. I was trying and to figure that out, because I, I remember talking to Tyler Michelow, who's a brilliant designer who's here today, and, and talking right. to him about that he had worked at, on productions at the Ohio, and I remember or even like meeting up with you there. Like I, I was like, did Tyler yeah. this? It, it's like a rhizome, uh, the connections. Tina, I, I know you have to go a bit earlier also because <laughs> you are teaching today. Um, tell us- 25 year olds and I try to talk, tell them this stuff, so. T tell us a bit. Um, so when my company house straddle, I had two, we had two shows at the new, at no, we were at the Worcester Group Ohio in the Ice Factory Festival in 2010 and then a show at the New Ohio. So the one at 2010 being part of that Ice Factory Festival was a huge deal for Half Straddle. The show was Nurses in New England. We had done one show at the Incubator Arts Project, the ontological hysteric, what that had become. And so we apply, I applied. No, I, I can't remember if that's when I first said we're naming this Half Straddle just to put on the application. Um, which might have been, um, but yeah, it that was like, you know, everything people have said today, I really relate to in terms of like the opportunity. And I, it was this, it was a chance like for this comp for our very young company, it was this chance to make something. And that's all I was hustling and fighting for at that point. And the validation of being in that series and that space. And then hilariously, I mean, I think about this all the time. It really echoes this thing of the space I mean, I knew what show I was going to try to do, but I, and now I'm like, I would never, ever, ever do this now. There were 10 people in it in a live four person band and we had to make a hospital set like and like on like three dollars. Like, it's so hilarious to me that we did that show there. Um, so that was the first one. And then through the another like new named kind of older like uh, with PS122 now called PS New York, Coil Festival, we got to go to there. And I, I I think we, I got to go around and look at number of spaces, but I think suddenly it was like, oh, actually the the new Ohio's could be a possibility. And that we're like, yes, we would, that is what we would love to do if that could work. So that was the two shows that Half Straddle did. And, and that was called Seagull Thinking of You and it was a Seagull adaptation. Um. Theater is changing. It's reflecting the world. And even looking back at Hamlet, you say, you know, it has the mirror, and theater does that. The world changes, but also theater changes, should change. But where does change take place? What are the spaces? So, and I think this is one. Chuck, you such an accomplished, great playwright. You know, if you look at these spaces, what do you think? We all, of course, know they are significant, but tell us, what do you think these spaces, what is their function? Why do we need them? 
city like the Ohio, you know, for a theater, you know, to to um, activate its potential new for every generation? Well, uh, I don't know if this is answering your question, but when you say that, it makes, I'm teaching playwriting at uh, Columbia mm -hmm. these days. And Columbia, the dean at Columbia a few years ago, raised a tremendous amount of money and built a whole new theater uh, called Lenfest. Uh, and up until that was built, uh, all of our playwrights, I've been teaching there since 2007, so I've been seeing a whole lot of playwrights over the years. And uh, in the previous years, their plays were always produced in the basement of Shapiro, uh, which is a dormitory building. Uh, and in the basement, there's a big black space and a little black space. And that's called the theater and the studio. Um, and the playwrights now, um, in their third year, they write what's called their thesis play uh, to graduate. And that's lined up with a festival at Lenfest. And most of my playwrights are in rebellion and do not want a play done at Lenfest. They want it back in the black box at the Shapiro dormitory in the basement. Um, and I'm with them. Uh, I feel that completely. And they can all, um, I mean, at Lenfest, there's the audience and then there's this modern piece of architecture and you put a set in it, but you're still there watching that modern piece of architecture. Um, Whereas in the Shapiro, in the in the large black box, um, you can have the audience sitting on three sides like this with the piece happening here, or on four sides, or on one side, or scattered around, or however you want. I mean, you know, they're like I think there are 73 different ways you can seat an audience in that black box. Uh, and that's what the playwrights love, among other things. Yeah. Um, Alex, for you, what did it mean to you? You had such an extraordinary career in theater, then also, of course, film, television. Uh, what did this space mean to you, the Ohio? I, I think that one of the things that is a bonus when a space is beautifully curated, like Robert did, is that it creates a community. Not only a community of people who know each other, but a community of people who like see each other's uh, work and are influenced by each other's work, who see actors, they fall in love with and want to work with and designers they fall in love with and want to work with. And so I think that that is one of the like values of a of, that, that's unique to the Ohio and the way that Robert ran it. And then the other thing that I that I, I loved about the, the unique character of the Ohio uh, among like other downtown institutions was there was something obviously so literate and sort of intelligent about the, the taste and the artists that Robert assembled, but also something that was completely unpretentious. Um, I think downtown theater can kind of have this false kind of reputation of being like pretentious, whereas usually a lot of it has a sense of humor. And I think that Robert's uh, vision of kind of like high and low and those dialectics was like fundamental to the space. I remember um, it, it, someone said something like this on the previous panel that Jeremy Dobrish at the, uh, with Adobe used to ha had this saying I remember that I loved about downtown theater with an uptown sensibility. And I feel like that really is what the Ohio inhabits. And when I get to work uptown, I try to think of it as uptown theater with a downtown sensibility. So I, I think it was, it was a beautiful, unique expression of a, of a art and taste. Yeah. Yeah. Or take the high low and the low high. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robert. Do you want to do you want to talk about Boozy for a second? Because that was one of your shows. Sure. Yeah. We. Uh, what about it? <laughs> we we turned the space on its side, so it's one of the. Every time I got to work in your space, I got to do a different configuration. We had animals, and uh, it was about Robert Moses and Le Corbusier, and it was like a sort of musical fantasia. Uh, and my chief memory about that experience was the night the New York Times came. Uh, one of the lead actors was sick, and I had to play the part. Never acted since, not really before.
I remember that uh, it had rabbits on stage in uh, one performance. A rabbit died during the show. It was very sad. Yeah, <laughs> it was very sad. But truly sad. Um, Dan, Lizard Brain also was such an iconic show. Um, w did it need a New York audience to be the show, or did it work the same way everywhere? Oh, I think it worked a, a few different ways. This is a show um, inspired by um, Temple Grandin uh, and her writing, Animals in Translation, her, her idea about three different brains that evolved one on top of the other, and we kind of developed our own acting styles based on these three brains and um, a kind of misunderstanding about Chekhov, that all of Chekhov is just wearing um, fancy hats and talking in an elevated way, <laughs> being concerned about uh, the house and the, the, the brothers. Um, and so these two weird ideas came together and, and made this, we made this piece. Um, yeah, right, where we were like, yeah, I don't know that I'd ever been sold out in New York City before and, and had that strange experience of like, I don't know if we got a ticket for you, Mark Russell, like that kind of like that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, like that's the only time I ever experienced that. Right. Well, just like that, I was like, we're already three oversold. What am I going to do? I have to kill some people. Um, Incredible. Uh, so um, believe it or not, we are already, you know, a little time. bit over a time, but what do we looking at the history what do you guys think um and melanie find it would be need something needs to happen but what do you think what do we need now in this moment at new york city i mean yeah because i i think that this it's space this the space and then a teeny bit of money of course you need a lot more money but in these days you'd get a little and that was just enough to do the hustle to get more I mean, I think there's it's a way bigger conversation because I think it's a little different now, but there is some, they are hustling down there now and it's a slightly different kind of hustle, but there is a layer of hustle happening. And I think if they get a little bit of space and the chance and a little bit of money, it's like so validating to be curated or asked into something. And then it's like, if you've got that stamina to like ruin your life and just keep hustling, you're going to ruin your life and keep hustling, <laughs> you know, or, or not. And you'll make other choices that, yeah. Or you, yeah. And I think to me, that's what kind of makes, I really hate to say this. I have to dash and go say these same things. To, to <laughs> like, Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I feel like the reality is what you're seeing is that virtually everybody on stage now and, uh, and throughout the whole evening could have their whole entire evening here around their work and the body of work they've done. So uh, I really appreciate that people just stopping in and um, saying nice things, but um, they maybe, could all have an entire evening. And maybe even short, you know, you guys, before we take our break, what is essential now? What's really urgent? Um, I mean, I, I just met with a former student who does comedy in Los Angeles, and he said this thing, which I hadn't thought of before, about live theater, that he had returned to live theater after trying to sell TV shows, and that he said, well, you know, at first, what's the point of theater? Because movies do it all better. And there were things that we could argue about about that. But he said, now, in the moment of AI, uh, all of us are going to become superfluous in digital media in years 10 years 20 years and so now more than ever uh the liveness is indisputable and and was part of his return to theater so i think i look at everything probably partly through the lens of like uh directors and theater makers and when i think about so many of the peer artists uh, directors who i really admire they really came up through creating their own theater company because they were able to uh, hire themselves as young people and hone an aesthetic. Um, and I guess what's, uh, you know, assisting, being an associate, all those sorts of things, you don't really get that same opportunity to find your voice. So I think any opportunity we can to create, uh, you know, the financial paradigm where people can do that, I think is, to me, that's essential for the next generation of theater makers. 
um, I just need to tell, I'll try to tell it as quickly as I can, this little story, which is the play inspired by Robert. Uh, it is about an artist who died 40 years ago named James Castle, uh, grew up in Idaho, and um, from the age of like four, loved to draw. Uh, but he was deaf and dumb and autistic, and his parents thought they needed to do something about that. So they sent him away to a school to learn how to do sign language and read. And um, after about six months, uh, the head of that school sent him home and said to his parents, we can't keep his attention. All he wants to do is draw. And his parents, upset by that, took away all of his art supplies and wouldn't let him have those. So um, he took the uh, shopping bags that his mother brought home from the market and um, soot from the fireplace and spit into the soot so that the soot and spit made ink that he drew on the um, grocery bags. Uh, you can buy some of those drawings now at an art gallery on 57th Street. Uh, a few years ago, they were $50,000 each. Um, but um, he did that uh, because he needed to make art. And I thought, yeah, and that's Robert Lyons. He needs to make theater. And I think that's true of everybody in the room. So, okay. Have your movies and your media and your computers, okay, but we need to make theater. So let me, uh, uh, spit ashes and dedication, you know, so that's uh, there's something. So we have a little break. And then we, I hope you all can stay to listen um, to Robert. And we have some food there. This is the biggest uh, catering of the year at the Siegel Center. No, no, no. So we all want you to stay and we have some wine here. But um, really, thank you all for coming. and hope you also see each other now. We haven't seen uh, for a while some places. So we're going to come back in in, in five, at, at six o'clock or yeah, maybe yeah, 545, 550. We're going to start again. So let's take a short break. And thank you for coming. Thank you. 
Probably a lot of Yeah, yeah. That, that was, I, I saw the uh, brain. I, I saw. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We, we, I did a I did a video by an hour
There's going to be a lot of it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. 
How did we do so far? Good. Yes, Yes, yes. Well, that made me feel good that I'm not on the archive. Yeah, yeah. I think that was so amazing. Hi. How are you doing? Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Not real love? Maybe 20. That's so we are moving on to the um, next part slowly. Oh, that's for. So. Um, okay, folks, we're going to start this sit part down slowly. Okay. The, the, the good news is there's going to be a party after this. So if you just uh, let us get this out of the way, we can all hang out and eat and drink. Put them down somewhere else. <laughs> You want to sit down? Okay. So um, welcome everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center. I'm Frank Henschke, who um, uh, runs the place. Uh, we normally do Bridge Academia and International Theater, New York and American Theater. Um, and so um, this is a, a great honor, as I said earlier, to have uh, Robert with us and the legacy he carries with him and the tradition and everybody who listened today and who saw all the images, you know, maybe has an even better understanding now of the significance of such a space. Someone said, you know, we take it all for granted in a way we was just there, but looking back, it's almost like a golden time, and, but it's still here. And now we have an opportunity to really listen um, to Robert, also Robert, uh, the artist, uh, you know, Robert, the producer and Robert, um, the thinker. So I would like to thank you all for taking your time to come out and honor. And I think we need to celebrate what's good in life what's good in the art and what's good in the city and spaces uh, like the Ohio make the city what it is. And uh, it's a unique thing, a flower that grew here uh, on the grounds of New York City. And I think art and humans are like flowers. We want to shine. Artists want to show their work. They want to grow up. They want to present it. Your bag of tea wants to have hot water and a beautiful cup inside. And I think uh, Robert gave a garden, he gave a, a, a teacup and a lot of water um, to make that happen. So I think first, uh, after listening to all of it, I think another round of applause for Robert. <laughs> so Robert, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in uh, the suburb of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, where I had zero interest in theater uh, all through high school and all through college. So I didn't get involved in theater until after I graduated. What were you interested in then at the time? 
I was a, I was writing. I was a writer. I was writing poetry and short stories. I got a degree in English. So that's the through line from there to here. So your idea was to be a writer? Yeah, that was that was roughly the idea. Um the <laughs> you know, I I graduated, I moved back into my house with my folks and my mother said I would pace the front window like a caged tiger. And um I it, I found out they um an envelope came in and they had taken out a life insurance policy on me when I was young, you know, when I was born and it had matured or whatever. And it was like $2,000 and, uh, they gave me that money and I packed a duffel bag and a typewriter, which was back then. And, um, got on a train and, and went to Massachusetts and went off on my adventure. Boston. Yeah, I was in Boston, uh, first and, uh, I was there about six or seven months, and then I moved to Rockport, Massachusetts, on Cape Ann, and um, so I was painting houses and um, beach bumming and writing poetry and, you know, having an adventure, and um, it was a dry town, and so I to to drink I had to hitchhike into Gloucester, which was down the road. Uh, it was one road straight shot, but it was about twenty fifteen minutes away. And uh, so I was I was hitchhiking down. To, I went to see a band in a bar, and um, instead of having a warm up band, they had a theater performance. And uh, I watched it. And I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty interesting. And uh, the artists who were involved were just clearly who they were, the actors and the other directors and stuff were all hanging out at the bar and they all stuck around for the band. It was a blues band. And I went over and I introduced myself to them. And uh, that was actually how I got interested in theater. That was my uh, original moment where I hitchhiked home that night and I had a short story and I said, um, well, I'm going to turn this into a play instead of a short story. And that's how I did that. And that's how I started my theater life. So you painted houses, the outside or inside or? Uh, both. Most, that was in the summer. So I was outside. Yeah. And we were painting like three story houses. So I was like 50 feet up a ladder. It was really insane. Yeah, so it was kind of, so you went home, you wrote. What happened to that play you wrote? I, I'm not sure what happened to that exact play. Uh, I wish I had it, of course, and that would be amazing. Um, but I eventually went from Rockport to um, Philadelphia and um, got a job at the Wilma Theater um, selling subscri season subscriptions mm -hmm. uh, on the phone. It was telemarketing for Wilma Theater. And uh, because I did that, they allowed me, uh, I could take a free class there. So I took a um, took a playwriting class um, at the Wilma Theater. And then I ended up working uh, at uh, People's Light and Theater, which is a theater outside of Philadelphia. And um, for a summer, and that was the first time I was ever in a rehearsal room. I was like an ASM for this festival. And uh, there was a guy named Murphy Dyer, and he was like, he wrote a play, he directed a play, acted in a play. And I was in his rehearsal space and I was like, okay, that's what I want to do right there. And uh, so I don't know if this is the same play, but I wrote a play that summer and the interns got to um, present their work, you know, do a little thing at the end of the summer festival. And uh, there was a director, uh, an actor who was supposed to direct my play and for whatever reason he couldn't do it at the end. So I directed it myself. And that was really the beginning when I was like, okay, I have found my people and I have found what I want to do. And uh, that's pretty much. You also performed it. You said I directed I did not perform it. That's the, that's the part I didn't play. actually do. Okay. Yeah, that, that I did. And how did you get, you wrote to the Vilma Theater letters that I would like, or you called them up or? I, that I, I don't remember. I might've just walked in the door. Um, but uh, I do remember this, and it, it is that uh, Blanca Ziska um, told me that they got a letter from somebody uh, who said, and they showed it to their board. They said, if your season is as is, uh, bright and fun as the young man who sold us our subscription, um, we'll be excited about that season. So anyway, uh, 
that was I was quite enthusiastic, I guess. <laughs> so that because of course I believed in the theater too. And, so that piece in the bar uh, in Massachusetts was that really the first piece you ever saw? It's not the first. Piece. What did you see first? I can only remember one other play, um, uh, seeing it at, on on, college, on Michigan State University where I went, and uh, I didn't stay for the second act, and I cannot even remember what the play was. So that was kind of, I was my head was not in theater at all. How did you get from Philadelphia to New York? Uh, I went to London, uh, via London, and uh, as a writer. Well, again, I was more of a vagabond, really, but um, I was writing, yes. And, um, I, you know, again, I was just really on an adventure, you know, I was just on an adventure, basically. Um, and I ended up working at a small theater called uh, Offstage, and it was a bookstore uh, on Camden, northern London, Camden Road. And I went in there, I saw it, and I was, oh my God, it's a bookstore of theater books. It was all theater books. And so I went in, I said, hey, are you looking for somebody to work here? And they said, uh, no, we're good, but we, we're opening a theater in the basement, and um, we're looking for you know, a stage manager. And I said, well, I can do that. You know, like, that's good, I can do that, totally. And so I ended up, they ended up hiring me, and I would, stayed in London for about a year and a half working shows there and reading every book in the store basically and ended up uh i was simon callow you know the name simon callow the actor he had a famous book about being an actor or on being an actor or something right after that came out he did his directing debut in the theater uh in that theater and i was his stage manager lighting designer and sound designer uh, in, in this little basement theater so i was i was all of those skills I'd picked up along the way, I kind of skipped something in Philadelphia. I, after um, I stage managed in, at People's Light, I worked at the Walnut Street Theater and learned, um, they hired, I talked myself into a job as an assistant lighting designer. And um, the first person, the first lighting designer who walked in was Jim Ingalls. And I said, um, hey, Jim, uh, you know, I don't really know how to do this. So you have to do you have to teach me this and you know of course he could have fired me and he said okay and uh he taught me how to do it and then i was there for the whole season but once you know i got the i got the gist of it and uh jim's an important person in my life uh that, which is why i name check him right there um when i first so then i'm in so then i'm in london then i get to new york and um i call jim ingles who is still my friend and said, could I stay on your, you know, can I sleep on your couch for two weeks and famously stay there for two years? Uh, the first two years I was in New York and he remains a very close and good friend of mine. Tell us about your parents. Where, how did you grow up? Wow. Uh, my father was an accountant at Chrysler and, uh, you know, most of the, most of my relatives worked in the, the auto industry. And um, my mother, uh, she worked at a newspaper and put him through, helped put him through college when he when he was young. And then she she stayed at home and raised us. And then when we went to college, she went back to work at a it was like an assistant to the principal at a elementary school or something like that. No art, you know. It was not an art environment. What, what do you remember from your childhood? Oh my goodness. I I did not have a lot of, uh, I remember having a pretty decent time of it, you know. I liked school. I had a lot of friends. Uh, so it was not a tortured childhood at all. And, um, but I, when I went to, when I went to um, school, I went as an advertising major. And that was my, that was what I could tell my folks, you know, like I'm going to school, I'm going to be an advertiser. And then while I was there, I switched over to English. And, and even then I was saying, well, I'm still going to be a copy, you know, I can write copy for advertising. And um, I guess what I remember uh, around that is I did a summer internship at um, 
Campbell Ewald, which is this major advertising firm, and uh, it was, went very well. And they said, well, when you graduate, you know, there's a job here for you. And uh, so I got, that's when I got out of school and I was like, it was, so I had the job, I had it all laid out there. And uh, I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I'm not doing that. Which is when I took off from. And the two years on the couch, were this writing then the writing years again? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the through line of all this, I was, I'm, I was always writing something. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, I was writing plays. And then that connects us uh, to, so I get to New York and then I'm on Jim's couch and somebody calls him up, Charlie Audi calls him up and says, hey, we're looking for a production manager for the show we're doing on Worcester Street. And, he, and Jim's like, hey, I got this guy on my couch. He could do it, you know? <laughs> And uh, so I went down to Wooster Street and I met Charlie and he had a company called Project 3. And there's Project 3 people in this audience here. It's Stephen Hayworth and Maggie. And, uh, and so I worked as a production manager on that show. And um, at that time, uh, the, the, the key people that I just want to spend a little time on Bill Hahn and Charles Magistro, they owned the building. And um, there were a couple, and you know they were eccentric as can possibly be. And they wanted it to be a theater and they wanted it to remain a theater. So all this conversation about space in New York was just this very idiosyncratic uh, situation where these two men you know, were cash poor, but they had this building and they wanted it to be a theater. And uh, that's when I met Bill and uh, I said, well, Bill, you know, who's running your theater? And he's like, nobody's running it right now. And I said, well, I could, I could run your theater. And uh, he said, okay, let's try it for a year. We'll try it for a year. And, uh, and we shook hands and uh, I did it for 20 some years in that space. He, uh, you know, at first it was with project three. So I was part of the project three ensemble. Charlie Audi was artistic director, and then Charlie uh, left the group, and I became the artistic director of that company. And uh, eventually, I got off of Jim, Jim's uh, couch and moved into the building. But uh, just to give you an idea, I moved into a room. He, it was very eccentric. He had a company that was building spiral staircases in, in, in the building, and there was a room inside of that. And he gave me the room inside of this shop. So that was... I, I, that's how I got in, but I knew I got my foot in the door, and I was like, "Okay, this I can work with this." Uh, and eventually, uh, I became the super of the building, which is why I had control of the heat. When we we're talking about that, I was uh, uh, I was the super of the building, and then um, moved into an actual loft space. So after two years on the couch, you made it into the spiral uh, room uh, of that. That's a, that is amazing. Tell us a little bit about your writing, your poetry. Um, uh, what is it about what you write? What did you write about? Um, you know, at that time, you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, it, it really moved. By that point, I was just writing plays. And um, the first show we did a project through is called uh, Dream Conspiracy, uh, which was basically a sex farce about third world debt. So um, that's... <laughs> So I was really into the politics of third world debt, but I was telling it through this very crazy story um, about, uh, it's hard to go into, but. And your poetry, are you part of kind of the New York school of you know, situational poetry? Was it, uh, um, what, what, are, what are your early poems about? Well, the, you know, it's funny, the, uh, actually I just had a guy who reached out to me uh, like two weeks ago and, uh, he, he, he actually found Lenora somehow, and uh, he said, hey, um, do you remember me? I can't even remember his name right now. And uh, he's like, I was in that playwriting, uh, the poetry class with you at MSU, and I was I was cleaning out my house, and I found this old anthology of poems, and, uh, and it was a page of your poems, and there's a, a note I wrote to him on this page, and so he sent it to me, and... Uh, so I just read these two poems that I had written when I was in college. And one was about sex and one was about God. So I was like, uh, 
I was taking on the big themes, young, and uh, but I don't know. I I I would I don't know how I would identify it. I was, yeah. I was just. So you also wrote short stories, also novels. Did you write a novel? No, I haven't done that. No, I was writing short stories. And... Tell us one of your short stories you wrote. If you oh my goodness, book. Frank, there's so much more to tell. Short story that I wrote. Well. Really, really, the short story that I was working on when I was in Massachusetts ended up being a play, and the play was called Cold Foot, and it was a relationship play, man and woman, young, two young people. I'm sure I was just writing about my life. So in a way, like a Chekhov, you had the, the dialogues of the early Tennessee Williams poetry, short stories, and um, and plays where so strongly... Um, strongly connected. Well, what's funny is like once I started writing plays, I stopped writing everything else, and I only wrote for the theater from that point forward. So there was there was a really clean break when I had that revelation um, that I knew I wanted to write for the theater. And and you know I will say this: I think that I think that good good plays are poetry, and I think the kind of precision and rhythm and attention to uh, rigor uh, that you apply to a poem uh, is also applied to theater text as well. So I feel like it's the same, uh, it's the same muscle, but it's just applied to a different, a different medium. But then I, that's it. I've only written plays since I went to the bar that fateful night. And and you were very close to writers. I mean, you, as I mentioned earlier, hosted uh, or you were friends with Coltesque. We had an evening here, and people said the most significant play um, in the second half of twentieth century, you know, was by Coltesque, the um, Cotton Fields, the Loneliness. Um, you were friends with Václav Havel. Um, tell us a little bit about those writers. Well, just clarify. I wasn't really friends with him. He stayed in uh, a well, studio. You knew him. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lenora. Yeah. I didn't really know. That and he, she did that. So just to clarify that, you're kind of scrambling. But you that. met him? No. Never. Okay. Yeah, I never met him. Uh, uh, Havel, uh, Edward Einhorn, uh, Untitled Theater, uh, produced a festival of Havel's work, and um, it was in several venues, including ours, and. I was a huge fan of uh, both of his plays, but also his political writing, which is which is brilliant. And uh, he was in New York City when that festival happened. And he came, I directed a, one of his plays called Protest. And he came to it with his wife and his security team and everybody. And um, he, he hung around for like a couple of days, you know, because we were doing a bunch of his shows. But I have one very specific memory of being at the our concession at our bar by the open barn doors and i saw him walking up there i thought oh, hey let me buy you a beer here and uh so i did and we started talking and he starts going yeah i'm working on this play right now and he just starts talking about this project he's writing and and then he's like what are you working on and i start telling him about what i was working on and i'm like i'm just hanging out with Vaclav Havel, drinking, drinking a beer, talking about playwrights. For anybody who doesn't it was know, one, like unbelievable moment. one of the great European playwrights who also spent time in prison and became the president of Czech Republic in a very significant time after the wall opened. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's one of many great memories of that one stands out for sure. Yeah, so Robert, <clears throat> theater, um, what do you think about it? What, do you, what does it... What does it mean? I, to, I really what, like what it. What does it mean to you? What are, so seriously, you know, you, you could have been so the 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 Why copyright theater? or the novelist went, went into theater. What is the function? What do you think it is? You know, I I, I really answer that. I, I think it's more like I just I really like uh, collaborating with other artists, and theater is the you know is is the, so intensely collaborative. Uh, and that's the thing that I love about it. And, um, as, you know, as a writer, you, you you put something on a page, but as you know, it doesn't exist unless it's on its feet. And then you've got directors and designers and actors and musicians and everybody uh, invests in that vision and feeds off of each other. And that's the process I saw at People's Light 
And that's when I knew, that's the thing that I saw. So it's less about like, I have some big idea about, you know, how important theater is and why it's important in the world, which I think it is. Uh, but it's something that I really like to do and I like to see it and I like to um, be around people who do it. And that, that's really what drove me. People who have to talk to each other, come to agreements and present some as a game. The, the, you know, the intensity and the motivation that uh, artists bring to that process is so high and so absolute. And, uh, and yet there has to be a flexibility in there as well. So you've got, you know, everything's pitched at this level and yet everybody has to work everything out together uh, toward this common goal of making this thing that everybody understands is bigger than any individual person. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a very intimate process and it's a process that bonds people together. And again, that's like, it's once I experienced that, I knew that that was, a good way for me to spend my time. Yeah, I mean, what also is remarkable, I think, in your work, you're um, like a great baseball player who does defense, offense, can hit, is a good team player, knows the rules. You did uh, stage managing, you uh, did lighting, um, you directed, you write. Um, so it's a very deep understanding, and you produce. Um, do you see it all connected, or do you have different hats on when you do these things? No, I think it was all one part of one journey. And I did, it was definitely like the journeyman, I, you know, an old apprenticeship model. I didn't study any of it in school. So I was just, once I was an assistant stage manager, then I was a stage manager, then I was a production manager, and then I learned how to design lights and the sound. And then I felt like, okay, I can direct now. And again, I'm writing through that whole period. So that's the constant that, that was carrying me through that. And then... Uh, but by the time I was directing, I felt like I had paid my dues, so to speak, and I understood, you know, the, how theatrical languages work and how they work together, and and uh, that's how I had the confidence to start directing my own plays. Yeah, yeah and and a deep love for the theater and the theater people, which come through. We have a quote upstairs of Fornas who says, "You have to love theater like your pet, you know, uh, like your dog, or your cat, you like your own, like your family." Um, how do you balance it? I know it's so hard. We also organize so much here, but how how are you able to balance the artistic work and that what must be from listening to the festivals, the openings, the workshops, the residencies? How do you, how how did, were you able to do this? Well, well, I mean, the one thing that is a good time to say this is, you know, of course, I was never just by myself, and uh, I always had, you know, producing partners with me and it's a good time to name them out right now which uh, Eric Youngworth who's not here he was very early on Wooster Street um, Vanessa Sparling who is here on Wooster Street and is now on my board of directors uh, uh, Mark Weiss who's here who joined it during the transition um, from Wooster Street to Christopher Street and was with me a long time and Jacqueline Biscop who's also is she still there yeah there she is so um, it, you know, it, even though it sounds like it was just me the whole time, obviously it wasn't just me, but it's always been a small team, but, uh, it hasn't just been me. And as far as balancing all those, um, you know, I ended up directing less. I, I directed a lot when I was younger and, uh, and I directed less as the demands of being the artistic director and being a playwright kind of became, you know, I, I couldn't quite do all three, so that's that's what left. But then I've worked with like amazing directors, Kristen Morting. I did a bunch of projects with, and I have to do a shout out to Daniel Irizarry, who's not here. He was his company was um, one of the one of our uh, archive residency companies, and I wrote a short piece for him called Yovo, and that was very actually that's a dense poetic text. Uh, it really felt like I was going back to my roots actually. Um, uh, which has now been performed in Cuba, uh, Poland, South Korea, and Poland. Did I say that? Poland. Anyway, somewhere else. And um, and that began this collaboration with him. And we then we did uh, my onlyness, which we talked about, which was so uh, big success last year. And that was I was just giving him 
like straight text, no stage directions, and then he would create this entire world around it. Uh, that piece has been invited to the Cebu International Theater Festival in Romania for 2025. So that piece lives and will go into Romania. And uh, and then we did the final show that closed the theater. Um, Ultra Left Violence was another collaboration with him. And that show will get its world premiere at La Mama in spring 2025. So we got a couple of big projects coming up. A project and you can pursue that. Um, who did you look up to as writers? Who inspired you? Um, Carol Churchill was a very significant writer for me. You know, I, I in a way, I feel like I I went through them all in a way. Like I would have phases. I was like in a Pinter phase, and I read all of Pinter, and then I read all of Sam Shepard, and then I read Carol Churchill. Again, I had this bookstore above me. Remember, so uh, in in London, so I had access to everything, and. Um, I just kind of read my way through uh, as much as I could. And, but maybe Carol Churchill sticks the most in my mind is. Why? Uh, the, the political perspective, uh, definitely. Uh, and, but the way she approached it, which was not necessarily direct or head on or didactic or um, dull, it was very theatrical. And uh, again, the kind of precision of her language and she could do a lot with very little mm -hmm. well, support. Yeah, Mao is really an uh, absolutely brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, did you ever also, were a theater doctor, like people of Jerome Robbins was famous, people would come to him. Were you dramaturgically involved? Did people ask, or do you say, I'll give you the space, here are the keys? How, how did that work? Were you on demand or not? Or uh, uh, For that kind of, uh, you know, I think one thing that you heard that everybody liked was like, I was very hands off. <laughs> and uh, I think that's why everybody liked, you know, uh, me. So, uh, no, you know, so no, I did not impose anything at all. Uh, people did, you know, uh, ask me to come to rehearsals and then said, what do I think? And and if I was invited in, I would, I would be, you know, I'd be honest and give feedback. Um, but um, I didn't see that as my role as artistic director to um, try to shape the work that was that was coming out. I felt like it was again, you know, um, finding artists that uh, I I was interested in and believed in and wanted to support, and then it was up to them to figure out what they're doing, <laughs> how to do it. When it comes to theater, next, of course, the artists who you work with, but who who inspired you deeply when you saw shows or um, performances in these 30 years of, of, of watching so carefully as a professional, also as a presenter and an artist, who 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 are your stars in the heaven? This parade of people that you, if you've been here all afternoon, um, pretty much. But uh, additionally, uh, uh, internationally, or you what? Uh, internationally, I guess uh, Lenora turned me on to Pina Bausch. That was a big, that was a big one. But that's not like the work I make at all. So, oh, you but know, what do you it, like? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the first shows I saw uh, when I came to New York was uh, Symphony of Rats, and uh, which is now playing, which is uh, Worcester Group and uh, Richard Foreman. And it was definitely one of the things that, like, you know, my head exploded and I went like, wow, I love this. I, don't, I have no idea what's happening, but I really like it. And so I guess, you know, we're saying like how these things bridge. I definitely caught Richard Foreman fever and uh, Worcester Group fever at that time. So I'd say those are two groups that were. But but again, by the time I got here, it was 87. So um, it wasn't, you know. It wasn't the 70s, and it wasn't even, it was just the end of the 80s. Looking at New York theater now, what what is working, what is not? What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think uh, that, that's a hard question, and I think um, one of, the, you know, I, I think there's a general sense that, that, that people are, that, people have to find new models and new paradigms for it. And, you know, I, I think that the, the, what's, 
given what we just heard, you know, there's a, the romanticizing of the Wooster Street uh, period, which was, was just no money, but, you know, pure drive. And I do believe that that drive is still here. Like that drive is always going to be in New York. People come to New York every year to make theater. And that is always true. And they graduate from school to make theater. So I, I think that that drive is, is, is here, is always here. It's more in Brooklyn now and Queens now. And, um, but how to make the system work again, you know, I, I guess I want to go back to Worcester street. That was such an, it, the reason that space exists was because of Bill and Charles and they wanted it to be a theater in spite, you know, if you think about the lost rental income that, you know, that they lost by keeping that theater as long as they did in Soho, you know, they're one of the great contributors to downtown theater in the money that they didn't make. And um, so, the, you know, that's not a replicatable model. That's that's just good luck uh, you know, that they existed and that uh, we found each other right at that moment. So it's hard to say uh, um, how, to, how to, you can't replicate that. That's just, um, that's just freak. I, I, I do think Somehow, and this goes, you know, I think theater has to figure itself out. One of the reasons I, I you know, it's time for me to step up, uh, aside was that it's time for other people to figure that out, you know, uh, and uh, younger people with new ideas. And, they, you know, I do feel that way. And I wasn't going to be the person who was going to be able to do that. So I, it's hard for me to answer that question. I think, I do think that um, from my time in London, something stuck with me, which was just that. Um, I was making theater there with, with friends and, um, but they, you know, they had access to healthcare. These are just other poor theater makers. They had subsidized housing and council flats. So they had, they everyone had a nice house. Everyone was seeing a doctor and they were on the dole. So everybody had a guaranteed, uh, universal income. And that's how they subsidized, uh, the theater, uh, which in our context has nothing, you know, like. I think a lot of that burden is being placed on the on the on the theater organizations to make up for the fact that those things don't exist in a wider social sense. And so I think part of the solution is making, you know, getting a universal income and getting universal health care and getting affordable housing, which um, is not limited to theater, but it would go a long way to making theater easier to make for people. Before we now come to to questions or comments or for Robert uh, from the audience, um, if you, let's say you had had a lot of money or more possible, what would you like to have done? What, what or did it, was there a project you had in mind and you couldn't do? What was your was there a special thing? Uh, you know, I, no, uh, uh, my mind didn't work that way, so uh, things didn't get framed like that really. Uh, I, I. The nice thing about the situation on Worcester Street is because we didn't have a lease, so it's at real limitations in terms of how institutional we could go. You know, my board was me and Lenora and my brother-in-law for 18 years or something, and you know we couldn't apply for capital money because we didn't have a lease, and so and it was year to year, and we didn't know it's year, it yeah, was year to year. Know, no, we took every year. year was a handshake with Bill for another year, and uh, th what that did was it prevented. Um, building out an institution in that context, uh, which I didn't really want to do anyway. And I can say that looking back, I, I can see it more clearly now, not that I was completely conscious of that as a young man, but uh, I, I really kind of believed in um, um, that it was possible to make really great theater without, um, without a lot of money and uh, so I didn't think about like, oh, if only I had money, I could do this. I was pretty much like, I want to do this, and this is how much money I have, so I would make it, you know, make it happen. And I think that's, you heard that a lot yeah. today, and that's, uh, I think, how that works. Yeah, Battle Brecht famously said, you build the house with the stones you have. Right. And I think you build um, the Ohio Theater, with um, what you have, which is so amazing in a lot of those, but the stones is the wrong word, but... Um, bricks of, of that great imaginary building of the mm. Ohio was not just the 
brick and mortar. It's an invisible building, a palazzo, which you put together and then everybody is near. So um, I can go around now and if there are any questions for Robert, now is the time to ask before he goes off to Cebu Festival and uh, on his world tours um, and um, about his work, about him or a comment um, about it. Maybe you introduce yourself shortly. We are still on how around so um, people will hear you. So um, I would say again, uh, Robert, um, uh, all our um, respect for what you did. Uh, congratulations on your life's work is something to be incredibly proud of. You made a real contribution to the city, to the theater, to the arts. And I think it's a, a life beautifully spent and it's really inspiring what you did and Thank how you. many lives um, you touched. So I think yeah. let's give an applause for Robert. Um, and And um, anybody? Yeah, I will. Yeah, just think it first. <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is John Kaplan. Um, I'm a playwright. I did a bunch of plays at the Ohio with Robert. And uh, two things occurred to me. Well, a few things, many things. Hearing people tonight, one is I'm very good friends with Robert, and to see his life at a distance, which I don't normally get to see, is very illuminating and wonderful and beautiful. To see those qualities that other people see in him in this room is something that I, I see in him close up. But because I'm close up, I don't get to see it in quite the quite the entirety that I, I see it here today, which is beautiful. The thing that, two things about the Ohio and you um, are that in my imagination as a writer, when I did my first play there, as I was writing it, I, I love the fact that you that the stage itself just went on forever. It wasn't a shoebox. You could put people at the end of the theater and you could barely see the person. And there was something very dreamlike about that that has stayed in my imagination. Now I'm still writing plays. And when I do, I, I realize without thinking about it, I'm putting them in the Ohio theater. Because it's not just that we came back and did it again and again. It got into our imaginations, not as a shoebox, not as the limitation. And the other thing is that that kind of marries the way that you did the work as a producer, as somebody who invited artists in. Because that yes that people are talking about was the yes of also endless space in our imaginations that you allowed. And you did do this thing of trusting people, which was extraordinary. You trusted people. That's what it means to give people the keys. I trust you to do a good job. That trust was so important as an artist that you trusted me that way. So I just want to tell you that and also to share with everybody here that that was my experience. I, I, I mean, I'll pick up, a, I just a couple of things. Uh, John's a great playwright, so I just want to say that. Uh, and also, uh, I do find like when I have dreams about the theater, they are always in the uh, Worcester Street Ohio Theater. You know, so it, it is an archetypal dream space uh, you know, on some level. Um, yeah, um, Ralph Lewis, um, thank you very much for this. You know, I, for me, I. Um, I always uh, loved the space because I thought it didn't look like a theater. And uh, I, I first started going there, a friend was in Arden Party and I went to see her shows and every time I went there, the space looked different. And that's what I loved about it. And I was very happy when uh, we got to do a performance night in the basement, uh, the storage area, because actually th that, was, that space was even more grand than, than the theater was. And I wonder, I don't think we've really touched on any of the things that took place outside of the wonderful theater that you had there. I wonder, like International Wow, didn't they explore other parts of the building? Or maybe you could talk about what you were trying to do upstairs for a while. Was it the fifth floor, sixth floor? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, other than the, the doors opening up onto the street, which you can imagine everybody, you know, loved to put that in the show. And, uh, 
because it was always amazing. But I can't think of uh, anything that happened outside. The, the things were pretty much inside. Um, I think what you're referring to is we also had uh, rehearsal space on the sixth floor of the building. Again, this is like so real estate. Bill and Charles uh, have an empty building, an empty half a floor. And uh, I'm like, Bill, can I use that as a rehearsal space? And he's like, yeah. So uh, again, that's why that existed. And um, we did reading series. We had a reading series up there and, and different rehearsals. At one point, uh, Tiny Mythic with Kristen Marting and Tim Maynard, um, it, you know, I gave that floor to them and it, it gave it to them uh, to run. And they got to have a little, they carved out a little office for themselves up there. And then they took over the booking of the rehearsal space and the running of the rehearsal space. Um, again, before they moved on to found here art center. So um, they were, they were definitely deeply embedded partners uh, in, at that time. Anyone else? I just have to mention the New Year's Eve parties. <laughs> Famous. Yeah. They were epic. <laughs> they, they were yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, I, 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 there's many, so many memories. But basically, we would have just we would just rage until like four thirty or something. And we just have to like throw the lights up and say, "Okay, you got to go home." And you know, like it's done. We have to finish. Uh, but I remember when somebody was working the box office and, and you know, whatever it was, $20 to get in or something. And, you know, we we're all partying and dancing and whatever. And at some point, it's like, uh, oh, no, I can't even think of her name, you know, let's say it's, help me, who is it, Vanessa? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Megan. And, you know, she was, and we're like, where's Megan? We haven't seen Megan, you know? And she had all the money. And uh, we're like looking around for her, and then we go to the back, and in the back, and there's the door to the theater, and the door is locked, and she's laying asleep outside of the door, holding the star of the money box in her lap at whatever three o'clock in the morning or something. And we were like, "Oh, Megan, hey, great! Oh my God, you you got the money, good." So that was kind of what that was like. Maybe one or two more. One. I just wanted to speak briefly because I wasn't able to be here earlier, but um, I, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me, I, I'm Amelie, I'm his daughter, if anyone doesn't know that. <laughs> um, but a lot of people ask me about like, oh, what, what was it like growing up in New York? And I don't know how to um, express actually like what it was like to grow up in a theater because there's there's an aspect of growing up in New York that is a shared experience um but as he mentioned we we lived in the same building I've heard my desk was referred to earlier my desk in the office um and you know coming back home after school and there's a new set to play on if people let me and the new shows to see um is just really was an incredibly unique experience that I'm very grateful. So I don't know. I just wanted to add that. <laughs> just, to, just to put a little, uh, a little on that, you know, her, her desk was like, you know, a little tiny desk. I don't know how old you were. If you were like four or five, I don't know. Older. You remember it. And, uh, but she uh, was famously one day, you know, people kept leaving things on her desk. And so she wrote a note and said, do not leave things on <laughs> Amelie's desk. You know, plopped it there. And uh, and we enforced that with great rigor. Uh... Well, I guess I just want to ask you if you would feel comfortable to share the process of leaving. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... I'll do my best. I think uh, it's interesting uh, to, to have that question come from you, uh, of, of course, uh, because uh, Melanie um, famously closed the Foundry Theater uh, at its, you know, at, at a very high level of producing and, and reputation and fame, and um, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, Melanie. Uh, 
you know, I've always looked to Melanie, uh, what, how does she do it? What is she doing uh, for mentorship and modeling? And so when you closed that, I was watching very closely. I was still, I don't know, how many years ago was that? I don't even know. 2019, the end of the year. Okay. 25th birthday. Of this yeah. Year. And um, I was, you know, we talked about it and uh, we watched how you did it. And you threw that great party at the Ukrainian uh, restaurant. And so that seed was planted in my mind um, through that experience. And so when it came time, uh, for me to feel like it was time for me to move on, you know, to stop and hand, hand things off. Um, all right. That was a, that was an influence on me. And of course we, I talked to you about that a lot when it was happening. And uh, I think that one of the things that made it possible for me to do it the way I did was the fact that I knew the theater was protected, uh, was, would continue on as a theater in the archive building. Cause that was an agreement that Rock Rose had with the city so I knew that it wasn't like the city was not losing a theater or the theater would continue. We completely renovated that theater and um, I felt like I was leaving it in, in better shape than I, than I had gotten it and, um, and that it would continue on as a theater. So I, I had that in the back of my mind that I knew I wasn't, uh, the story was not another theater space lost in, in Manhattan. Um, but that said, uh, it, it was it, it was time, you know, it was time for me personally. I've been doing it a really long time. I, I will say this about that is like, I don't, you know, uh, I didn't go through all of this stuff thinking, God, I've been doing this a long time. It really has only been since, you know, I stopped and now everyone's like, wow, you really did that a long time. And I'm like, man, yeah, now that you mention it, yeah, I've been doing this for a really long time. Uh, so I think that, and that's part of like being here today is just like these relationships, you know, these, with these companies were eight, 10 years, you know, like it wasn't, the, you know, the, it, it, these were long, important and influential relationships artistically, personally. And, um, but, uh, I was at, you know, I'll, I'll turn 65, uh, this summer and, uh, the field's changing, you know, the money was, <laughs> was dropping out post post pandemic and I just thought it's really time to to give this to some fresh blood and some fresh thinking and fresh ideas and uh, so that's what drove me to that I would say that the my the experience you know the most concrete uh experience of having done that is that you know my inbox uh, just dropped off a cliff <laughs> yeah probably like you wake up and check your email and there's you know 50 and then you go down and there's like Hey, is this thing working? Refresh, you know, like really? Nobody is writing me for anything. Uh, so I think that's the biggest, you know, material uh, thing that I've had to uh, reframe my expectation about uh, opening my, my inbox, and and to be, uh, and and to realize that I have to generate all those emails now, right? Like I have to write people, and if I want emails, I have to. I, ha I have to be the generator and I realized and it was a very privileged position for me to be in that for a long time I was the person you know people are hey circling back on this I didn't hear back from you about this and uh, and now I'm that person going hey I say that email I just, want to, I just want to make sure you got it you know uh, and so. you have a book project right um yes so the other thing uh, I've been talking to Frank and um we're going to uh, I'm going to put together a book. I'm going to assemble a book. I'll, I'll, I'll write some of it. Uh, some of it hopefully will be interviews with the artists, um, photos, some of the photos that you've been seeing here. Um, and we'll be putting that together and it will be published by Frank's Press, right? Yeah, I think so. What do you think? Ah, absolutely. Absolutely. So listen, uh, Robert, uh, it's, it, it was a dream for many people to get to the Ohio. People, you know, now... Uh, Felt it was a dream working there. Now people dream about the writers. You dream about it. So it was a, a space of dreams and in a way, a good American dream as much as people make fun of it. But it really is and was in this fantastic, especially to Europe where I'm coming from and where things are so very different. And what he did and what you guys all do, he has a really a sensational in the way of the energy, the ideas, uh, the uh, productivity to do something. And, um, and I think this is an incredible model of what you created and something to to look up to and i think it will be forever written in the history books so um 
and come come to an end. We're gonna have something to drink here and something to eat, all in honor of Robert Lyons, the Ohio and the new Ohio. So thank you and stand up, Robert. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Thank you.